two men. Two philosophies. Two choices. One decision. You decide. Well, hello, my name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now since 1989 I've been an evangelist and I travel and speak on creation versus evolution. It is my great privilege to do debates at universities against the people who believe in evolution. Now, in this debate you're about to watch, I debated Dr. Pigliucci. This is my second time to debate him. Uh, each time we've had a debate, there were problems with the camera, the microphone, something went wrong. This debate was taped uh, by two different cameras, one on just VHS and one on uh, digital. The problem was the digital camera had a problem with the audio and the VHS camera had a problem with the uh, video. So we ended up doing the best we could from the two tapes of splicing them together. You will find times throughout here where the quality is not very good and I apologize for that. Uh, I'm sorry, we did not tape it at all. Somebody else taped it for us and sent us the tapes. So uh, we can't take the blame for this, but we, uh, really think the material was offered was, was worth having, so that's why we've put this into our debate series. Dr. Pigliucci is from Italy, it's very difficult to understand sometimes, and you may have to play his section a few times to understand what he's saying. He talks fast with a thick uh, uh, Italian accent, plus does not keep the microphone very, very well in front of his face, so we apologize for that also. Anyway, I've offered to debate him again. I'll take on the whole UT science faculty at the same time with half my brain tied behind my back. We hope you enjoyed this debate. If you have any questions afterwards, Please don't hesitate to call. Our website is drdino.com, or you can call our office 850-479-DINO. Uh, if you have some professors in your school that would like to have a debate, I do many debates and will fly up at my expense uh, and debate any number of professors at the same time. And that ought to help uh, raise a crowd. Generally, there's over a thousand people that come to these things. The room will be packed, I assure you. If you want to have a debate at your university, count me in. I'd love to do it. Thank you so much. Research is on evolution of genotype and environmental interactions, i.e., the nature of the nurture problem. He received his doctorate in genetics at the University of Ferrara in Italy and his PhD in botany from the University of Connecticut. He's currently working on a PhD in philosophy at the University of Tennessee. He's published 47 technical papers and two books on evolutionary biology. Dr. Pagucci has been awarded several times the Oak Ridge National Labs Award for Excellence in Research and has won the prestigious Stabilizing <coughs> Prize from the Society for the Study of Evolution. As a skeptic, he's published in national magazines such as Skeptic and Skeptical Inquirer. He's given lectures for many humanist and free thought groups around the country and has debated several creationists, including Dwayne Gish and Ken Hogan. He produces a monthly e-column called Rationally Speaking and has authored Tales of the Rational, Skeptical Essays about Nature and Science, available in the lobby. His most recent, uh, some of his selected skeptic publications include Bioscience, Skeptical Inquirer, and one title in particular to point out, A Case Against God, Science and the Falsifiability Question in Theology. Dr. Ken Hogan is considered by many to be one of the leading authorities on science and the Bible, and he's dedicated to the proclamation of factual scientific evidence that supports the biblical record of creation. His seminars, he writes, have caused even the most devout evolutionists to sit up and take notice. He's a 15-year veteran high school science teacher, and his love for science sparked his interest in creation versus evolution. He saw the need for exposing evolution as a dangerous religious worldview and for arming Christians with scientific evidence that there are no contradictions between true science and the Bible. In response to these needs, shortly after finishing his PhD in education, he began the full-time ministry of creation science and evangelism. Since its beginning in 1989, his ministry has continued to grow 
and he speaks over 700 times each year in public and private schools, churches, university debates, and on radio and television broadcasts. His humorous, fast-paced, illustrated seminars provide documented evidence against the unscientific theory of evolution. The information presented concerning dinosaurs in the Bible and the few that are still alive today reflects his study in the field of cryptozoology. His goal is to strengthen faith of believers and to confound and convict the evolutionists and to win the lost Christ. He offers a quarter million dollars to anyone with real scientific evidence for evolution. He lives in Pensacola, Florida with his wife, Joe, and two of their three children. The third child, Eric, also lives in Pensacola and speaks on creation. The format tonight will be fairly simple and straightforward. Each speaker will be given 30 minutes, and there will be no interruptions from the audience or one speaker to the other at that time. And we've already decided who will go first. That's Dr. Kukluchi. And since it was a football day, naturally had to flip a coin to decide who would go first. After that, we'll have a short break. We'll gather written questions. You should have received some pieces of paper as you wandered in. You'll find some folks posted in each aisle during the break. So be sure they get the questions. They'll deliver them to me, and we'll start sorting them at that time. Then, when we regather, two 15-minute rebuttals from each side, and then the series of question and answer. During the Q&A, each person, the person to whom the question is directed will be given two minutes to respond to the question. The other person will be given one minute for rebuttal. Okay, Dr. Gucci. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. Thanks, everyone, for coming here. Uh, let me tell you a couple things about what I would like to do tonight. One thing that I'm not interested in doing um, is in convincing anybody that there is no God. This is not that kind of debate. We're talking about science tonight. The other thing that I would like to do, on the other hand, is to tell you what evolution actually is about, because there's a lot of misconception um, on this particular topic. And so, during my opening statement, essentially I will give a very brief evolution one-on-one, -on -one so that we're clear on what we're talking about. Of course. Uh, there is not enough time to give a full course in, in, in evolution and biology, so I have to leave out a lot of stuff. And I will focus on two or three major examples to give you a flavor of what evolution and biologists actually do and, and, and what they're talking about. And in the rebuttal part, I will address um, my opponent the specific points um, when they come up. Um, incidentally, given that um, Mr. Hamlin here has debated hundreds of times, apparently, uh, if there is anybody here that, is, that has a hand of tuning for the underdog, that would be me. <laughs> Okay, so what is it evolution is and is not? Let me give you a, a roadmap of what I'm going to be telling you in the next few minutes uh, that is useful, I think, to understand the evolution creation debate. First of all, evolution is defined in a couple of different ways, uh, and it's not defined the way creation is defined. The way a professional biologist defines evolution is either one of these two. One, it's a change in gene frequencies. So a change in the frequencies of the genetic constitution of an organism constitutes evolution, it's the simplest definition of evolution. Or, the more complicated uh, definition of evolution, and actually the one that Darwin gave originally, is the central modification. That is, evolution is about change in organisms that are related to each other to some extent. Contrary to what most creationists think, evolution is not, it's got anything to do with the origin of life, uh, and we'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. And evolution also has got nothing to do with the origin of the universe. Those are two distinct scientific, these are scientific questions. I'm not denying that they are scientific questions, they're just not evolutionary questions. <coughs> and also, one of the tenets of evolutionary biology is that the explanation of the, uh, for the diversity of life on Earth, which is what we're interested in here tonight, does not require intelligent design. That does not mean that there is no God, which is why I said a minute ago that I'm not here to convince anybody about the existence or inexistence of God. I'm just saying that a natural explanation of diversity of life is possible, and which is what science is about. So let's start on the first on the first count, which is evolution as a change in gene frequencies. That molecule over there is a, a sample of DNA, which is what uh, your genes and everybody else's genes are made of. 
the evidence and the theory from, uh, for, for the fact that evolution does occur in, in the sense that gene, uh, genes do change in frequency in natural populations come from, the theory comes from population genetics, which is a, a highly mathematical branch of uh, evolutionary biology. It has been, um, people have been publishing in that, in that area for the last um, about 100 years or so. The empirical evidence comes from molecular biology, especially modern molecular biology, uh, provides you evidence of changing, changes in gene frequencies in populations under your body now, they happen as we speak. Examples are innumerable, uh, and they cover every known kind of organism. There are studies in both theoretical population genetics and empirical molecular biology on viruses, bacteria, plants, fungi, animals, including mammals, um, uh, primates, and humans themselves. It's, uh, one of the branches of molecular evolution in biology deals with the evolution of man or humans. Now let's get into an example, a specific example. As I said, I cannot uh, give too, man, too much information into, into a 30 minute format, um, and I wouldn't want it otherwise, but let's get into a specific, uh, couple of specific examples and you get a flavor of what evolution biologists actually do. And I hope that you'll get the idea that evolution biologists don't go out there trying to convince people that there is a God. What we do is this. One of the things that we study is, for example, the evolution of the HIV virus. Now, you all know that the HIV virus causes a uh, disease of uh, the immune system. Uh, it is very common among vertebrates. In fact, it's found among dolphins as well. Something like the HIV virus is found among dolphins, which is why there's that pretty picture of dolphin out there. There are two major kinds of human HIV virus, and one of them, so-called HIV, they're called HIV-1 and HIV-2, I guess the person who discovered them wasn't too much into imaginative uh, names. But HIV-1 evolved from a chimp, from chimp virus, and attacked human populations in the 1940s. You can determine that both from molecular biology and from epidemiological studies. And then it spread to Europe, in, in, uh, in the 1970s. We actually know the person who brought it to Europe. Uh, it was a, a Swedish or a Norwegian um, settler who was, had been working in Africa for the previous uh, decade or so. Uh, and he went back there, and that he was the person who was infected. All of the European forms of HIV are derived from that particular individual. And the reason you can, you can tell that is because of the tools that molecular evolution in biology has, has available. As you also probably know, AIDS is very difficult to cure. And the reasons, in order to understand the reasons, you have to understand some evolutionary biology. Uh, it's evolutionary biology that tells you why it is that HIV is so difficult to cure. For one thing, the virus, which you're seeing over here, attacking a human cell, that's a human lymphocyte cell, a human uh, defense uh, immune system cell. Uh, the virus mutates very rapidly. Mutations are one of the two fundamental components of evolution. Evolution works with two fundamental processes. One is mutation, which is random, and the other one is natural selection, which is not random. Well, mutations in the HIV virus occur very rapidly, which is one of the reasons uh, that, that um, uh, it's very difficult to find a cure, uh, because it literally mutates under your very nose, since it has a very rapid uh, uh, life cycle. The other one is the environment. The environment of an HIV virus is very complex because it depends on the sexual behavior of individuals, which are very complex and varied across the world. And in fact, they are so varied that there are different kinds of HIV virus that are adapted to exploit one kind of sexual behavior or another. All of this is perfectly understandable in terms of evolution. What you're looking at from the 1940s on is the evolution of a new form of virus and how it spreads uh, through populations and adapts to new conditions. Um, this is exactly what evolution in biology to predict. Now, what about the idea of evolution as the center of modification, which was Darwin's original uh, definition of, of evolution? So well, that's what he meant. He, he wasn't uh, aware of this particular kind of diagram, but this is a diagram of the evolution of the ceratopsians. The ceratopsians are the tree-horned dinosaurs, uh, which are very common um, uh, in museums, in paleontological museums all over the place. Uh, that's what we know right now, as of now, of the evolution of ceratopsians. Uh, these are the different forms and how they are related to each other. You can see, incidentally, that there are a lot of intermediate forms, uh, which is another one of the myths of creation, that the intermediate forms are not there. Well, evolution is the same with modification, that is, as this kind of diagram and, uh, that, that I'm showing here, it's studied by a variety of disciplines, including comparative anatomy and paleontology. And the evidence for this evolution uh, by uh, ascent is, uh, comes from a variety of disciplines, uh, from organisms and morphology, from the study of the physiology of the organism, from the development of biology. All of these different pieces of information, which of course I don't have time to get to give you any 
video at this point, will fit very well with each other, and they represent the general evolutionary explanation of how life actually diverges. There's also, of course, evidence from the fossil record, and what you're looking at here is the evidence from the fossil record, or it's part of the evidence from the fossil record. I'll show you a few other uh, pieces of evidence from the fossil record in a minute. But this is what evolutionary biologists mean by descent from uh, biomodification. <coughs> Let me give a specific example, like in the case of the HIV virus for molecular evolution, let me give you a specific example in the case of the sentinel modification. One of the best known examples of the sentinel modification that we have come to understand in the last few years is the evolution of whales, which is sort of summarized over here. Uh, these are the actual skeletons that have been found in the, in the fossil record. These are the actual whales, uh, currently living whales. There are two major kinds of whales, the sperm whales and the white whales is over here. So the baleen whales are one kind and the toothed whales are the other kind. These are some of the intermediate in, in the fossil record, and this is a reconstruction of what these in might have looked like. Well, how do we know? Because we have a bunch of intermediates. Of course, we don't have the actual animals, so this fierce creature that it's looking at you is not what we have. What we have is the skeleton of that fierce creature. Um, the evolution of whales started about 55 million years ago uh, with some animals of this kind, which are called mesonicates. These were hyena-like creatures. Uh, there were scavengers and fish hunters. And if you want to uh, find something today that essentially has the same ecological niche, um, you would have to look no further than bears. Bears have actually a habit and a, and a, and a um, way of living that's pretty similar to what the uh, would have had 55 million years ago. Then there is a large number of intermediate forms which have always been discovered in the last few years. Until a few years ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you this story about the evolution of whales because we didn't know anything about the evolution of whales. Uh, 53 million years ago, it is only a couple of million years after the animal that I just showed you, and that's nothing in, in geological terms. It's a blink of an eye. Another animal appeared called Hamaliosetus. It lived in fresh water and the sea. If you wait another 3 million years, you have Pachycetus, which lived on both land and water. And then you have this guy over here, Ambulocetus, which appeared between 45 and 50 million years ago. It had very reduced limbs, and you can see already that it looks much more similar to what today is our marine mammals than to the animal that I showed you a minute ago. In fact, it looks pretty much, and it has the same kind of habit, it had probably the same kind of habit, and the same kind of uh, uh, lifestyle, I'll say a sea lion. So if you want to see what an intermediate form will look like actually today, just have to go to the zoo and look at these kind of animals live. Of course, I'm not saying that a sea lion is an intermediate between whales and whale insects, but it looks like what an intermediate would have been. Um, a little later on, 25 to 40 million years ago, we have this fellow, Basilosaurus, and a variety of other species of which we have found the, um, the fossils. And this thing really looks, has extremely reduced limbs, and it really had a completely marine um, habit. We know that because it's found only in sediments that accumulate under marine conditions, not under, under fresh water. So, we actually know from combining these two kinds of information, the fossil information about the evolution by, uh, of whales by the sand, and the molecular uh, biology of, of whales, that in fact whales are fairly closely related to hippos, which are these animals that we're showing you here, as the hippo and there's the whale. Um, they're very closely related, meaning that they shared a common ancestor, last common ancestor, only about 55 million years ago. That's not that long ago. Um, they both swim before walking. Obviously, the whales never walk, but the uh, hippos do swim before walking. They have they nurse their young underwater. Um, their testicles remain inside the body, like the like in, like in the case of the whales. Uh, they are hairless, like in the case of the whales, because they're not very useful underwater. And they don't sweat again for the same reason. It's not very useful to sweat in the water, so they don't have glands to sweat. The third point that I wanted to make was that evolution is not a theory of the origin of life. The origin of life is sometimes caricatured as this thing over here. This is the primordial suit. That's my version of the primordial suit. Um, the idea that there was this kind of uh, rough of uh, complex organic compounds that somehow uh, gave origin to, to life on Earth. The may or may not have been the case. There are several alternative theories on the origin of life. But one, my point that I want to make tonight is that evolution is nothing <coughs> with the origin of life. The reason for that is because evolution requires what is called heritable variation for natural selection to act. Before there were living organisms, by definition, there was no heritable variation. There was no genetic variation of, of these organisms because organisms were not there to begin with. 
So the transition between the non-living and the living, it's not really a matter of evolutionary biology at all. It is a matter of physical chemistry, or the interface between physical chemistry and biology. In fact, most of the people that work on the origin of life, and it is a very active uh, field of research, there are several people that are interested in it. Most of those people are actually biophysicists or chemists, not biologists, for the good reason that there is nothing really that an evolutionary biologist can say one way or the other about the origin of life. It's just a different problem. Now, that doesn't mean that the origin of life is not a scientific problem. Of course it is. It's a pretty tough problem because it's something that happened probably only once and probably a long time ago. So, it's, and of course, there's very little or nothing in the fossil record that can help us to figure it out. So it is a very tough problem. But there are different ways of approaching it. I'm certainly not going to do the answer tonight. For one thing, it's because nobody knows the answer. For the other thing, it's because it will require a separate lecture just on that. But one of the clues is coming from these kind of pictures and this kind of theory. Uh, there is a, a, a theory in um, a branch of mathematics now, and it's called complexity theory, which deals with the emergence of complex systems. And one of the things that this complexity theory explains is the emergence of these complex systems. You can't see much because this is a satellite picture uh, taken at very low resolution. But those were things that you're looking at there are uh, convective cells that form spontaneously in the upper atmosphere. Uh, there is no way to explain these, these complex uh, natural phenomena. Um, unless you allow for the, what's called the emergent property of the interaction of the molecules that make up these, uh, these cells. Well, complexity theory explains how these things originate. And complexity theory is currently the best, our best choice, our best bet, to explain the emergence of another complex system, which is life on Earth. <coughs> so people are working on it. I might get back to you on that, on that you know, in a few years. The fourth point that I wanted to make was that evolution is not a theory about the origin of the universe. The universe evolved, or you, you hear that the universe has evolved or is evolving, but it evolves only in a general, in a very general sense, in the sense of change through time. Well, change through time is not what evolutionary biologists uh, consider evolution. There is no selection, no mutation. There's no mutations, no, 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 no process equivalent to mutation in the formation of universes. And there is no natural selection that we know of, at least, in the origin of, of universes. So this, those are really, literally, apples and oranges. Uh, now, we do know something about the origin of the universe. Again, this is some of the empirical evidence. This is a beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, these things, which are called proto-galaxies, these are the building blocks of galaxies. These are very far away, and they existed a long time ago. The only reason we can see them now is because life takes several hundred million years of years come back to, to us from them. So we actually can peek at what was happening directly by telescopic observation, what was happening uh, a few uh, millions of years or tens of millions of years after the origin of the universe. There's also an interesting set of theoretical um, research that actually addresses the, uh, the origin of the universe. There are two major uh, uh, branches of uh, modern uh, physics that are trying to explain this kind of phenomenon. One is the general, general theory of relativity proposed by Einstein at the beginning of the uh, century. And the other one is quantum mechanics, and the Einstein actually never could quite accept, accept because it just didn't fit his, his view of the world, and which was developed, ironically, um, based on Einstein's own uh, research. Well, these two pieces of information uh, are actually coming together in the 21st century in what uh, physicists are now calling superstrings theory. Superstrings theory is, among other, other things, is one of our best bets to, to explain how the, actual, the universe originated and why the universe that we live in is the way we, we observe it. Um, I can give you plenty of references if you want to learn about superstrings theory. It's an extremely complicated branch of mathematics, but it is a fascinating enterprise. Now, after I told you all of this, and I told you, well, evolution is not about this, and it's not about that, well, does that mean that evolution failed if they cannot answer what creation is called the origin question? So if evolution is, cannot tell you how life originated, or how the universe originated, isn't that a failure of evolutionary biology? From what I told you so far, you should have realized that that's not the case, because that literally is fucking apple and oranges. Or if you want to use a different metaphor, it's like understanding a baseball game applying the rules of basketball. It just doesn't work that way. It's like asking uh, theoretical physicists to explain evolutionary biology. Well, theoretical physicists wouldn't know where to begin with, because evolutionary biology has very little to do with quantum mechanics. <coughs> Um, so there are, these are valid scientific questions, but they cannot be held 
against evolutionary biology. So, well, yeah, you can explain the origin of life, therefore, what are you talking about? Uh, it just doesn't work that way. The last point that I wanted to make before concluding the opening statement is to address the question of, well, does um, the, the variety of life on Earth require intelligent design? Which is, of course, why uh, most people that are here tonight are interested in it. Um, and intelligent design, of course, can be a variety of things. Creationists don't necessarily agree on what intelligent design is to begin with. Um, some of them think of certain kinds of God, a certain kind of God. Some of them actually think of, uh, believe it or not, uh, very smart extraterrestrials, a la Star Trek. But the question is, there are logical objections to the application of intelligent design theory to the explanation of life and One is that it violates what it's called Occam's razor. Occam's razor, uh, which was proposed by William of Occam in the 13th, 13th century, is actually the idea that you should avoid unnecessary hypotheses in order to explain something. What is an unnecessary hypothesis? <laughs> well, for example, I can explain why this, this, uh, you're looking at this presentation uh, based on the laws of physics. Based on what I little I know about physics, I can tell you that there are some electrons that are pointing, are coming here from my computer and they go down here, they're falling all the way up there, back to the projector, and the projector generates an image that is projected. I can, I can explain both with optics and, and um, some of other physics what's happening. I could also say, on top of that, there is a, a tiny little green monster which is actually taking these images from here and it's putting them directly up there. That's possible. You would have to ask me, first of all, if it is invisible, how do you know that it's a green, for one thing? But do I need that kind of explanation? No, I don't. That doesn't mean that there is no little green monster bringing my, my little electrons on the, on the, all the way to the image. It just is that I don't need that explanation. And it's not a good scientific theory. The reason for that is because you can come up with an infinite number of alternative stories uh, that would all be equally unfalsifiable. There would be no way to test if they're right or not. And it would be all equally redundant. That's what uh, Occam's razor does, and that's what creationism does with evolution. The second thing that creationism does with, uh, with respect to evolution is it violates something that is sometimes called uh, Jung's dictum. Uh, Jung didn't say exactly along these, these lines, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially said that when you want uh, me to believe about extraordinary claims, you have to provide extraordinary evidence. But the more extraordinary the claim is, the more extraordinary the evidence uh, has to be. Let me give you another, another example. Uh, suppose that a friend of yours tells you, uh, you know, just five minutes ago, I walked across the street and I went to the Coke machine and got a Coke. Well, you wouldn't require any evidence from that kind of statement, because that's a fairly believable evident, uh, statement. It may or may not be true. I mean, I might not have walked over there, but nevertheless, it doesn't really uh, tickle your, your um, curiosity that much. But what if that person says, you know, I just disappeared from the front of this building and I materialized on the other side of the, of the street and got my coke and then rematerialized that. Now you've got my attention. And now the question is, well, okay, what kind of evidence do you have that you can actually materialize and dematerialize at, at will? Why? Because that's a fairly extraordinary claim. And if you want me to believe that's a fairly extraordinary claim, you have to provide me fairly extraordinary evidence. So the difference between evolution and creation is that we have a pretty good explanation by no means perfect, but a pretty good explanation, scientific and nature explanation, of how life on Earth diversified. If you want me to believe otherwise, and if you want to believe that there was a direct intervention or supernatural being, of which we have no evidence and no way to uh, entity, uh, check what, what that uh, supernatural being is, well, then the burden of proof seems to be it's on, on the other side, which is what I just said. Uh, now, why do I say this? Because there are a couple of things about, a couple of basic observations you can make about life on Earth, which are really directly against any explanation of intelligent design. For one thing, the story of life on Earth is very idiosyncratic. Um, it indicates, therefore, what scientists call contingency and necessity. Contingency is the, the hazard, um, uh, a series of hazard events that have no particular reason to happen in one way or another, or at one time or another. And then necessity is uh, nature selection. That is, the organisms that survive tend, tend to be the ones that have the most perfect progeny. Well, one big example of, of um, contingency is the extinction of the dinosaurs. They got bad luck that day, 65 million years ago, when a meteor struck the Earth and wiped them out. They ate several hundred thousand other species. Um, there's no reason why that could happen. One 
should have happened one way or the other, just did. Um, there is some speculation, which is kind of interesting to think about, that if it didn't happen, uh, dinosaurs would have evolved something like uh, consciousness, and there will be a dinosaur here talking to you guys and trying to explain why it's with all these little mammals around here and made it beyond the stage of rats, uh, which is what mammals wear when the dinosaurs went extinct. Uh, it is possible that one of the reasons you're here tonight to enjoy these talks is because the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, but that was certainly a matter of contingency. The other kind of observation, which actually Darwin already made, is that organisms, contrary to what creationists would make you believe, are not well designed at all. In fact, are fairly badly, badly designed. One of the best examples of badly designed organs is actually the eye. The eye is, the human eye is uh, usually brought up as an example of extremely complicated and very well designed uh, uh, structure. Well, it is extremely complicated. It has been designed by natural selection over hundreds of millions of years. And it, work, it works pretty well, although not perfectly, obviously, because right now I see a notion of more or less undifferentiated people if I take these off. It's not perfect. But it's not perfect in a more fundamental way. Uh, for example, uh, not many people realize that the human eye has blood vessels right in front of it. Okay, on the, on the, in front of the radio. Instead of where a good engineer would put them, which is behind. Uh, one of the things that, that that does is it causes all sorts of, of vision problems, including the fact that you have a blind spot. Now, could it be designed better? Yes. Has it been designed better? Yes. If you look at the eye of squids or octopuses or, or animals of that sort, actually they have the blood vessels in the back, not in the front. So I will conclude that either there was no intelligent designer and squids just got luckier than human beings, or the intelligent designer liked human beings much better than, than I mean, squids much better than human beings, which is possible. <laughs> now, thank you. I will actually not be <coughs> This is my last slide uh, for the introductory statement. Uh, if you have not followed all that I, uh, I said, or if you would like to learn more, uh, that is the webpage where this thing is down there. Uh, it's called fpbiobutkedu skeptic. Uh, I will repeat this later on in the rebuttal. The, the um, as I said, it's quite typical for people that are, you know, that are flooded with a lot of information all at once actually to be able not to follow the whole thing. That's, that happens to me right now. So the, the presentation is up there for anybody to see. Now the question is, what is the evidence? Let me present you in one little game. Suppose that you were looking at these pictures. Would you be able, without hesitation, to pick a human being as different from uh, common ancestors of human beings or from other species of primates? In some cases it might be easy, but in some cases it might be a little bit difficult. It's not that easy. Um, here's the human being, it's down here. But look, Homo habilis and Rectus skulls look pretty much very similar, and those are two of our ancestors. And anything, in fact, within this line is not that different. It's a clearly variation in the same team. You can <coughs> tell an Astrophyticus, for example, from any of the Homo's. Uh, because an Astrophyticus was a much different kind of animal, although it is in the line, direct line of descent of, of human beings. But the point is, can you really look at a picture like that and think that you are completely different from anything else that is up there other than this? You have the same bones, you have, they are organized in the same way, you have the same kind of chemical substances in the, in the blood, you have made, you're made of the same proteins, of the same kind of DNA. In fact, the difference in DNA between human and chimp, on average, is about 2%. Can any rational person look at something like that and say, no, I really don't think that we're made of the same thing. We're completely different things. We were, we're completely independent. We have no relationship whatsoever. That's what evolution tells you. You do have a relationship. Like it or not, I mean, I don't particularly enjoy being uh, the descendant of this little fellow over here, <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, uh, that is our best guess to what actually really happened. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Ken Hovind. I have taught high school science 15 years, and now I get to defend the biblical view of creation against those who believe. And evolution. And I appreciate the pointing out the obvious uh, similarities between all these different animals. I think it ought to be obvious to any freshman law student that that proves a common designer, not a common ancestor. But we'll get into more of that uh, later. Anyway, I would prefer a point-by-point -point debate because uh, 
Dr. Craig Newton made about 30 different points, and I've got several pages of notes, and we're never going to get through them all. In a point by point <laughs> area, instead of minute by minute, you can take one topic and finish it, as opposed to, you know, give 20 points and then you don't get time to respond to all of them. Uh, in a point by point debate, the opponent simply uh, cannot, cannot change the subject to draw attention away from the fact that they don't have an answer. Okay. Now, we need to define some terms. Uh, according to your website, I mean, you spent uh, $60,000 in uh, one project, $124,000, $70,000. Total $650,000 you've had in grant money to study evolution. I think uh, I'm the underdog. <coughs> now, I have never received, uh, I've never received one penny in federal funding, and I don't get paid by the university to uh, conduct my ministry. We do this all on uh, uh, my own expense. And you notice, I noticed in your website and in your book that you have done a lot of study on plants. You have the dicot, the monocot, the tricot. I think uh, the average five-year-old would say that's still a plant. You know, it's the same kind of animal. The Bible says they'll bring forth after their kind, which is exactly what you've seen happen in your laboratory. So uh, you've done a great job of confirming God's word, and I thank you very much for that. <coughs> All right, we need to define some terms. Evolution is defined as a number of different things in the dictionary. Uh, movement of a series, but the part we're talking about tonight is the development of a species, organism, etc., from its original to its present state. Well, now exactly how far back do you go to get the original? He spent most of his 30 minutes tonight talking about, you know, evolution is only, you know, once life gets here. Well, where did life come from? It really is part of the argument because the evolutionist ultimately has to believe that we all came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. Though, slowly, of course. Uh, the theory that all species develop from earlier forms, this is a typical uh, dictionary definition of uh, evolution. Now science is things that we can observe, things that we can study, things that we know. God is the creator of science. God gave us the ability to study and to observe and to know. And uh, the eyeball is fascinating. I can't believe you brought that up, Dr. Uh, the Well, we can get into more than the rebuttal, but I can't, can't pass that one up. The retina in, in your eye is protected by blood vessels in front because we live in the air. UV light is not a good insulator for air. And uh, the blood, blood vessels are the body's last defense against ultraviolet light. Now, octopus live in the water, and water stops UV light. So they don't need the blood vessels in front, they need them behind so they can see better in low light conditions. Now, if you believe uh, you know, the octopus has a better eye, I will pay to have yours swap with an octopus any time. <laughs> Um, so, science is things that we can observe, things that we can test or demonstrate. A theory is a speculative plan, a formulation of underlying principles of certain observed phenomena which has been observed to some degree. <coughs> principles of an art or science rather than its practice or a conjecture or a guess. Now, a myth is a traditional story serving to explain some phenomena. I contend that evolution is a myth. It is not observable. There's no observable evidence. We are so convinced there's no evidence for evolution. We offer a quarter million dollars to our ministry. I don't have the money, but a rich friend of mine does. <clears throat> quarter million dollars for anybody with any real scientific evidence for evolution. It is nothing but mythology that students are all paying to be taught. Okay, it's a fictitious story, a person or a thing, according to the dictionary. This fellow said, evolution and the myth of creationism. I need to object to once again, as I've done 50 sometimes, when they introduce the debate, they always say, it is evolution versus creationism. If anything isn't ism, it is evolutionism, not creationism. If you're going to call one an ism, they both should be isms. Okay, so it's evolution versus creation, or evolutionism versus creation. Here's the problem with this title. They put the ism on creation, and it should be on evolution. Myth also applies to evolution, and the facts supporting evolution have all been disproven or misinterpreted. And I took curious, curious notes on all the things he was giving us evidence for evolution, and if we had time to go point by point, we could refute all of those very easily. You may want to watch my 15-hour seminar where I do just that uh, on videotape out there. Um, many evolutionists will not debate against creationists, and I really appreciate Dr. Pagliucci debating Wayne Gibbs four times and me now for the second time. I can tell you it is very difficult to find an opponent. I would not want to defend the idea that we all came from a rock. I don't know why anybody would either, but some people, you know, it is hard to find an opponent for this. Uh, they prefer to be in front of their students where they have the academic advantage and psychological advantage. They don't like to take on creationists, and they give all sorts of reasons for this. Dr. Eugenia Scott, I debated one time on the radio, uh, I'm glad to do it again, 
She said, you should not debate creationists because they present the flood of points you don't have time to refute. Called the Gish Gallup is what they've dubbed it. It's Wayne Gish will give 50 points and you don't have time to refute it. Well, that's my whole point. I'd rather do this point by point. And I asked you before if you'd like to do that. And you said, no, you'd rather have 30 minutes and me take 30 minutes. Okay, well, we can do it this way. But uh, during Q&A, maybe we can just go point by point until the point is finished. Okay? They get 100% of class time for all the students, six hours a day, all year, for 12 to 20 years without getting any evidence against their theory or for creation. So I think, yes, we do give a flood of points because we only get a short amount of time to, to get the job done. Uh, that does not prove the flood of points is wrong, of course. It's just a, a cop-out saying they give too many points to refute. That is not an answer uh, at all. Uh, they say they attract more creationist supporters than scientists. Well, not everyone's welcome to come tonight. We're doing this on your university. You know, I'll be glad to go to any university anytime at my expense, and debate against evolution. I think students need to hear the other side. And who gets to decide who's a scientist anyway? See, in the evolutionist mind, if you don't believe in evolution, you're not a scientist, and therefore, all scientists believe in evolution. You don't need to be a genius to figure out what little problem there if you're gonna let them define who is a scientist. And the public, G Genius Scott says, the public rarely has the background to understand the complex answers. Let me translate that for you. We're smart and you're dumb. If you don't believe in evolution. That's how that translates. Anybody else get that translation out of it when you read it? That's what I got out of it. Um, they're going to say the creationists like debates because it will ensure that a bigger crowd than if they spoke alone at some church. I, I, I would challenge you, Dr. Baby Uchi or any other evolutionist, I want you to schedule a meeting to speak on evolution when there is no debate, when there's nobody, uh, no controversy, and no students are required to come as part of the grade and see how many folks show up. Just, just try that sometime. I average over 1,000 a week in churches I speak at, and it's a church of 15,000. Uh, people come, people flock for this topic, okay? And nobody's forced to come to my seminars like they are at the university where they have to go to some, some class, you know, to get the grade or something like that. So schedule a voluntary meeting and see how many folks come. I think you'll be surprised. Here's how science is supposed to work. You're supposed to observe the universe. You're supposed to create a hypothesis or a theory to explain what happened. You're supposed to present evidence. And I like what you said about Hume's, uh, uh, it wasn't Hume's razor, what was it, Hume's, uh, uh, Occam's razor, but Hume's, uh, victim, okay, yeah, like Aristotle's did. If you have an extraordinary point, you need to a claim, you need to have some extraordinary evidence. And I think to claim that we all came from Iraq 4.6 billion years ago is an extraordinary claim. And that would require some extraordinary evidence before I'm going to cheerfully volunteer to let my tax dollars pay to have that be taught to all the students in the school system. And if the theory cannot be, or can be falsified, you should throw it out and go back and get a new one, new theory. If you cannot falsify it, possibly you have the right theory. And then you keep testing and testing, and somebody someday decides it is a law, like the law of gravity. That's how it's supposed to work. Okay. The creationists have a theory, and the evolutionists have a theory. They call theirs a theory, so let's subject, subject it to the scientific method. What observations do we have to support the idea that any animal ever changed into another kind of animal? You showed some pictures up there of the whale, and I'd love to spend an hour getting into the evolution of the whale. And I'd, I'd like you to show real, honest pictures of what they actually found, not the reconstructed uh, idea of what it might have looked like. And I think the average audience would be surprised at how little evidence there is. Oh. And plus, if you find a bone in the dirt, all you know is it died. <laughs> you don't even know where it died. You just know where it ended up getting buried, that's all. That's all you know. And you sure don't know that it had any kids. And you don't know that, and you definitely don't know that it had different kids. And why did the evolutionists claim the bones in the dirt can do something the animals today cannot do? The bones in the dirt could produce different kinds of offspring, but the animals today cannot. I mean, if a bear is turning into a whale, those bears are still having babies. Let's see it happen again. Only let's watch it this time. And what mechanism has been observed to bring about these incredible changes that they talk about? And are there any other explanations for how these limited changes can happen? This textbook says the Colorado River has cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. Now, hold on just a second. Let me explain something that every science student ought to learn in third grade, okay? <coughs> there are facts. It is a fact. Grand Canyon exists. <coughs> then there are interpretations of that fact. The creationists have an interpretation. 
and the evolutionists have an interpretation. The creationist says it formed quickly by lots of water over a little bit of time. The evolutionist says it formed slowly by a little bit of water over lots of time. Now the fact is the canyon exists. Whose interpretation is right? That's not part of the fact. That's just the interpretation of the fact. It's a fact the earth has many layers of sediment. No argument out of me. I've seen it. I've been to, let's see, 26 countries and all 50 states and eight, seven Canadian provinces and uh, I've seen lots of Grand, Grand Canyon and lots of canyons climbed on 40 volcanoes. There's no question the earth has lots of layers. How did they get there? Well, the creationist says these layers are from the flood of Noah. The evolutionist says each layer could represent millions of years. Now, what happens, the students are often taught that this line really doesn't exist, and you know that the evolutionist interpretation is part of the fact column. And that is where the tragedy comes in. No, that line definitely does exist, okay? And your interpretation of the fact is not part of the fact. I'll show you. If you built a dam across Grand Canyon, a huge lake would form behind it. Actually, Grand Canyon is a breached dam. As anybody that studies the topic will know, the snow line on that picture kind of tells the story. In between those two red lines is snow, the white part, and that is a higher elevation. Grand Canyon is cut across the middle of a wrinkle like called the kind of uplift. It's like a long range, a ridge of a mountain range, like wrinkling a piece of carpet, a fold in the carpet. Okay. The top of this uh, Kaibab uplift is about seven or 8,000 feet above sea level. The river enters the canyon 2,800 feet above sea level. Now, that's interesting. The river flows downhill. All known rivers flow downhill. Okay? As the river is flowing downhill, the ground is rising up. <coughs> now, let's just study the scientific observations here, okay? The top of the canyon is higher than the bottom. Anybody disagree? There's nothing done, okay? The river runs through the bottom. Still with me? The top is higher than where the river enters the canyon by 4,000 feet. Rivers don't flow uphill. There is no delta. Where is the mud that washed out? That river did not make that canyon. Now, it's a fact Grand Canyon exists, but the evolutionist interpretation that it happened slowly over millions of years does not stand up to scientific scrutiny. Their interpretation is falsified. That river did not make that canyon, I'm sorry. If you would like millions of years for your frog to turn into a prince, I can understand why you would need that, but you can't have it, at least you can't use Grand Canyon as evidence for it. The creationist interpretation says, 6,000 years ago or so, God made everything in six days. And that explains why we have so many millions of symbiosis relationships. Animals and plants were created, designed for each other, and created within a day or so of each other. That works just great. If you want them to evolve separately and slowly over millions of years, you have a multitude of problems that come in, which are just glossed over by the evolutionist. It amazes me how they can grossly oversimplify life and oversimplify the complexity of living things and just assume, well, it must have happened because here we are. <laughs> That's not evidence. Uh, Charles Darwin, <clears throat> fresh out of Bible college at age 22, sailed around the world on board the Beagle in 1831. As he sailed around, Charlie came to the Galapagos Islands and he noticed there were 14 varieties of finches on these islands. He studied them carefully. Charlie hated birds. He liked worms. And he thought it was mean for birds to eat worms, so he shot all the birds he could because it was kind of hard on the worms getting chewed up, he thought. And so he really was you know, an unusual fellow. But he did raise pigeons, kind of a strange guy. He married his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood. We can go on all day about Charlie if you'd like. But anyway, Charlie noticed there were 14 varieties of finches. He concluded that all these finches <clears throat> had a common ancestor. <laughs> I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. <laughs> And then he said in his book on page 170, <clears throat> and I've got the book there. I guess I didn't bring my stuff in. It's in the car, but it says tomorrow I'm speaking to church in power. Uh, Charlie said in his book, it is a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Well, now hold on just a minute. You count 14 varieties of finches, and then you conclude that finches and bananas are related? I think that's a little bit of a stretch from the observation, don't you think? Isn't that what he's saying? Birds and bananas are related? Am, am I reading that wrong? That's what he said. Everything is related.
regulated based on 14 kinds of birds? No, no, Charlie. See, what Charlie observed is often called microevolution. Now, microevolution is a lousy term. I don't like it, but everybody uses it, so we're stuck with it. And Dr. Pitt spent a lot of his time trying to deflect what I'm about to say here. Uh, microevolution is a fact of science, folks. It happens. It is observable. Dogs produce a variety of dogs. Big dogs, little dogs, probably have a common ancestor. Uh, dog. <laughs> and big roses and little roses and yellow roses and white roses and red roses and pink roses probably have a common ancestor. Uh, rose. See, microevolution is absurd. This word evolution really does have six different meanings or stages or levels, whatever you want to call it. Cosmic evolution is the big bang. So evolution is say this is not part of the argument about evolution. Okay. Well, if it's really not part of the argument about evolution, then why don't you help me get it out of the books? Because I guarantee the biology books used in this campus that you teach from have this included in with the books on evolution. It starts off with statements like that. Take it out of the books if it's not part of the subject, okay? This book has it for a high school student. 18, 20 billion years ago, there's a fact. Well, let's get that out of the books. Science books ought to teach science, okay? Then they're going to say, uh, the second one would be chemical evolution. According to the Big Bang, hydrogen was produced and a little bit of helium. Well, there are 92 different, 107 different elements if you count the synthetic ones. How did they evolve? This is not talked about much, but chemicals would have to evolve, folks. I mean, that's a long, each molecule is, or chemical is incredibly complicated. Just the right number of protons and electrons and neutrons, and it's just really pretty interesting. They are so complex. They don't talk about that much, but there would have to be some chemical evolution. Then we'd have to have stellar and planetary evolution. How did the stars evolve? If evolution is true, star births should equal star deaths. We see stars dying all the time with supernovas and novas. Nobody's ever proven one star birth. And yet there's enough stars out there that everybody on Earth can own two trillion of them to themselves. Where's the star births going on? Nobody's ever proven one. They say, well, in Crab Nebula, there's a bright spot we think is a star being born. Well, it might be the dust is clearing, and you're seeing one that was back behind it. Mm -hmm. And one star forming is not how, it's explaining how we got all the zillions of them up there. One evolutionist told me, he said, we've calculated if 20 stars explode near each other, it'll create the energy to create a star. Oh, well, that's brilliant. You've got to lose 20 to gain one? You should run for Congress, man. You can help those guys borrow their way out of debt. <laughs> This textbook says, as Earth formed, the surface was like the moon. Earth's surface was hot, and there were large pools of bubbling lava. But oceans formed as it rained on the rocks for millions of years. Yes, boys and girls, millions of years of torrential rains created the oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Oh, I guess it is. It's totally stopped. Doesn't happen at all. That's how slow it is. This guy says in a college textbook, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. Now, if this is not part of the argument about evolution, then get it out of the course you teach on evolutionary biology. See, students are being deceived by the meaning of this word evolution. Then we have to have organic evolution, the origin of life. Ultimately, the evolutionist has to believe in spontaneous generation, which was proven wrong for the last few centuries, all sorts of folks have proven it doesn't happen. Go read the reports of Francisco Reddy and Louis Pasteur, and you'll see spontaneous generation doesn't happen. But the evolutionist has no other choice. They'll say it had to happen because we're here. Oh, that's, that's brilliant logic, all right? See, according to the theory, if we simplify here, you got 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, and then 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cools down, and 3 billion years ago, life appears in the soup. And this early life form finds somebody to marry. A pretty good trick, of course, and something to eat, and very slowly evolves into everything we see today, from elephants to bananas and humans, all came from this soup. That's what the theory says. I mean, I'm not making it up. It's their, it's their theory. I didn't make that. Now, uh, chemical, uh, cosmic chemical and stellar evolution would take place first, and then we have organic evolution, origin of life, and then we have macro evolution, changing from one kind of animal into a totally different kind of animal. Those are the first few steps of evolution, the first five of the six that I have there, and those aren't talked about much. They try to focus the attention on variations within living kinds right there. 
And that's what Dr. Pigliucci is trying to do tonight. He's trying to show us variations within the same kind of plant or animal and draw attention away from the first five major steps that would have had to take place in order for this sixth one to even be able to ha start happening. So microevolution, though it's a lousy term, is science. Variations happen within the same kind of animal. You admit the first four steps are not proven and are not part of science, not part of evolution at least, then why don't you help them get them out of the books used on this campus? How many students in this campus right here? Would you report to me in about three or four months and tell me how much effort he has put into getting those out of the textbooks, please? Okay? Let me know. See, the textbook here says, mammals, birds, and crocodiles have a common ancestor. Now this is pure speculation. This is a this is, this is propaganda, Soviet style. That's not science. All those trees of life with their branches of our ancestors is a lot of nonsense. Even Mary Leakey admits that, and she believes in evolution. British Museum of Natural History has a director called Colin Patterson. He was asked, uh, Luther Sunderland read his book, read, read Patterson's book about evolution. Patterson wrote a book about, about evolution. Sunderland read it and said, Mr. Patterson, I read your book about evolution, but I noticed you never showed any missing links. Why didn't you show us any missing links? Patterson wrote back and said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line, there is not one such fossil. Now, Dr. Big Yushi claims there is a multitude of intermediate fossils. Dr. Colin Patterson, who has his hands on the largest fossil collection in the world, says there isn't one. Somebody is mistaken here, folks. Even Stephen Gould, the communist professor at Harvard, says the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks are not from the evidence of fossils. They make up these trees. It's based on imagination. It doesn't happen. It's true dogs produce a variety of dogs. No argument on me. That happens. And you might get some really wild, you know, wild dogs. I mean, really bizarre variations. But you're always going to get a dog. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. And if it did, who would it marry? Think about it. You might get a big dog or a little dog, but you're always going to get a dog. <clears throat> and it could be the dog, the wolf, and the coyote have a common ancestor. I would not argue about that. But they're still the same kind of animal. Let's see if we can find the youngest kid in the room here. Anybody here under seven? How old is he? Six and a half. What's your name? What? Joshua? Joshua, up here on the screen, I have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? <laughs> the banana. Let's give him a hand. All we observe are variations within the same kind of animal. It could be that the horse and the zebra have a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. Stand back and look at them. They're the same kind of animal. That doesn't prove a horse and a banana are related, folks. Uh, what happens, students are asked to make a giant leap of faith and logic, totally in the absence of any scientific evidence, to believe in macroevolution, which says the dog and the rose have a common ancestor, if you go back far enough in time, and it was a rock. That's based on a fantasy, based upon imagination. See, this, this is never talked about. This one's not talked about much. This one is talked about a little bit, but they really focus on microevolution or variations within the same kind. And that's all it is, is a variation. But we don't argue about that. That happens. The rest is assumed. They try to sneak them in as if it's a package deal. Well, if you believe in evolution, you have to believe in the whole thing. You have five minutes left. Oh, man, I'm just getting rolling. Okay. <laughs> Number six of those six is true, but the other five are smuggled in. Students are given one definition, like descent with modification, which is true. Even Dr. Pigliucci tonight in his slide said, evolution is a change in gene frequency over time. Now that is kind of a deceitful definition of evolution, because that's the same as I've said, the animals are gonna bring forth after their kind, and you might get a gene frequency. But see, changing the gene frequency does not change the genetic complexity, and it doesn't add any new information. It doesn't make a new animal. Changing the gene frequency is like scrambling up the letters of the English alphabet. You will never get Chinese words that way. And evolution requires changing into a totally different kind, a totally new genetic information. Watch what this textbook does. Evolution means a change over time. That's definition number one.
This one says evolution is defined as a change in species over time. Oh, now they've narrowed it here now, haven't they? If you really mean species change over time, I agree that we call it all. It's what's implied that I don't like. See, they slip in the other definitions of evolution, like cosmic and organic, and say, then they tell the students, if you don't believe in evolution, you don't understand science. Well, I'm sorry, I think I do understand science pretty well. I taught it 15 years. And evolution is not part of science. It is a religious worldview that is unsupported by science, and I, for one, am sick and tired of paying for it having to be taught in our public school system. In advertising, it's called bait and switch. If I said, new Mercedes, 10 bucks, everybody would line up at the door to buy it. Well, when you got there and I said, hey, actually, it's 99,000. Well, I baited you to come in and switched it. That's illegal. People go to jail for that. And professors ought to go to jail for baiting the students to believe in evolution with variations and then switching it midstream. Bible warned us about science that is falsely so called, and evolution is not science. It's a religious worldview, and if you want to believe in it, that's perfectly fine. But keep it at home, please. Don't bring it into a tax supported institution. It has nothing to do with science. Um, so, what's in these books? Dr. Figliucci gave all sorts of evidence of evolution, which we'll have to take up in the rebuttal time. How much time left? Three minutes. I'll get a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, Here's the evidence they use. He mentioned fossils. I was really surprised at that one. The vestigial structures he did not mention, but this is in almost every textbook. Uh, fossil structure, molecular biology, development, uh, DNA similarities, structure of the limbs, or the homology argument, and poor design, like the eyeball. That one ought to be out gone a long time ago. The eyeball is very well designed. And the reason so many folks have glasses is probably more dietary or inherited uh, genetic problems from, you know, when you realize you're a copy off 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 a copy of the original Adam, I think it's pretty good that we can see it all. You get a computer program and copy it, then copy the copy, and copy the copy of the copy, and copy the copy of the copy of the copy. You do that about 500 times, and then put it in your computer and tell it to run. See how it does. You have an incredibly complex gene code that is still working pretty good. And to say that we have glasses as evidence for evolution is absolutely ridiculous. Now, the fact that the eyeball is unbelievably complicated. Darwin said, if my theory was true, numberless and immediate varieties must have existed. Where are these missing links? Well, David Rock of the uh, Near American Museum of Natural History says, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. There is some fantasy in the books used in this campus right here. Things that are used to support evolution that don't, that ought to be taken out. There aren't any missing links, folks. The whole chain is missing. <laughs> Darwin, or uh, Gould said, the absence of fossil evidence is an agony problem for evolution. We know the theory is true, but now we just need the evidence. <laughs> That's not how science works, Steve. <laughs> okay? Find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died, folks. That's it. That's not evidence for evolution. Fossils don't offer any evidence at all. You don't know that it had any kids. You certainly don't know that it had different kids. And just because you can arrange them in some kind of preconceived idea of what you think might have happened, that wouldn't hold up two seconds in the court of law. I can arrange knives and forks and spoons in order and prove they evolved from each other. <laughs> Doesn't prove a thing. Each one was designed. We'll get into more in the royal section about the embryology. You mentioned development. I was surprised that that was still in there after being proven wrong 140, uh, 127 years ago. We'll get into that later. Thank you, sir. So I've got some quotes from, from his presentation. He said, it amazes me how evolutionists can oversimplify. I doubt it. It amazes me how he can oversimplify science. Uh, listening to his tirade was one of the most simplistic versions of science I've ever heard, and I was really astonished. I mean, the, the writers of Star Trek get it much better. Uh, not only in the details, but in general pictures. According to modern physicists, biologists, astronomers, geologists, chemists, and all the others, these people that spend their lives getting PhDs and working in labs, oh, a bunch of fools. After all, it is obvious that there is something that a 70 year old could get just in a minute. Do you smell the rock there? <laughs> it is that really conceivable, a conceivable thing. I mean, these people are all a bunch of idiots out there that, that are being paid, um, and they spend a lot of time studying. To come up with things that, golly, if you just think about it for one second, you realize that they're funny, they are wrong. I think the thing is a little more complicated than that, um, than you can think of it myself. And by the way, 
what is the problem with bananas anyway? <laughs> <laughs> so many times. So many times. There's a problem with bananas. Evolutionists don't say that, that dogs or monkeys come from bananas. That's not what we say. <laughs> now, men also consider that he has managed to talk for over 30 minutes, no, for about 30 minutes, and said nothing, not a single thing, in favor of the creation of his mother. He seems to be thinking that he went by, the, by default, but this is not a match, this is not a sports match, not if your opponent leaves, you're left the winner. The burden of proof is on both sides, not on one. It's not because you find a couple of months of evolution, <laughs> any evolution biologist, by the way, would readily say that there are problems with evolution. I'm a professional evolution biologist. If there were no problems with evolution, if we knew everything, I would be out of job. And that wouldn't be good. So it's in my interest that there are problems. Now he said, if the Big Bang and the origin of life are not science, why not get them out of the textbooks? Well, you didn't listen. That's not what I said. I said that uh, Big Bang and the origin of life are not questions within evolution biology. Now that they're not science. I did say that they're science. I even proposed a couple of uh, areas of science that are actually working on those problems. So they're not supposed to get out of textbooks. They're supposed to get into the physics textbooks and into the chemistry textbooks, respectfully, not in evolution biology textbooks. And by the way, they are not in evolution biology textbooks. Uh, the origin of life is mentioned in the beginning of a few paragraphs in some general biology books, but not in evolution biology textbooks. Evolution biology just doesn't deal with it. I want to be a millionaire. Uh, so I'm in here proposed $250,000. I heard that it has been going iron higher and higher, apparently, the amount of money you're giving. Well, he gives this to whoever proves beyond reasonable doubt, of course, to his satisfaction, that evolution is the cause of the existence of all the ordered universes, which I said evolution is nothing about, nothing to say about the order of the universe. The variety of life forms on Earth, that is evolution. And the fact that man is the most advanced of such life forms, I don't even know what the most advanced life form actually means. There are plenty of animals that do much better on this planet than we do, so I don't understand what that word means. But anyway, I did give my evidence on all those counts to Mr. Alvin. The last time we met in Atlanta, a few months ago, I don't even receive a reply. I don't have the money. <laughs> The kind of tales that you find in the following sources. One of the things, if you visit your web, his website, is very, it's very instructive. I spent uh, countless enjoyable minutes on it. For example, he believes that dinosaurs live among us. And what is the truth? Well, by golly, there is a picture of the Loch Ness Monster over there. <laughs> of course, that has been the bunk, and the kind, that kind of picture you find usually, usually things like uh, you know, the Weekly World News, together with uh, a jumping at blockbuster and a Chicago woman has three brains. You think of that sort of thing, kind of evidence that we have. Um, he claims that that picture has not been defined, it has. Um, he also believes that evolution has been shown to be false, because there was a link to his from US website of this kind of source. This would really be a problem of evolution in biology. Uh, this is supposed to be a dinosaur skeleton, a skull, directly eating a human being. Now, if you're in, in, um, about climatologists, you smell another rock right there. And sure enough, that was actually an apple fool. It was a hoax put up by the news from Mexican science in Greece. And they did say that it was an, an, an apple fool. Of course, after April. First. Um, this is not even on the mainstream of, of the creationist uh, uh, establishment. Uh, you mentioned Dr. Duane Dish, which I had uh, the pleasure of debating several times, uh, from the Eastern for Creation Research. Well, Dr. Gish disagrees with several things that Mr. Darwin believes in. For example, Mr. Darwin believes that this is a real thing. This is the Palazzo River in Texas, so-called human tracks, which are found right next to dinosaurs. And again, one of those proofs that dinosaurs existed at the same time as humans. Too bad that they're being defined. They're actually dinosaur tracks. And not even these information research believes this thing anymore. He certainly does, at least the last time I checked his website. Um, I would maintain that his predictions are pretty bogus. Um, he had on his website, he's not there anymore now, that the New World Order will implement a world domination plan by May 5, 2000. The world's population will be reduced then to 500 million people. Well, it hasn't happened yet. So what can we be using now? Certainly not, not the regular one, because we still haven't seen a New World Order, and the world population, unfortunately, is up to 6 billion. Now, there's a series of other preposterous statements. I'm just going to list them because it's really difficult to, to disprove them. And they don't require to disprove. The Smithsonian Institute killed thousands of people to amend their collection of human missing names. Five billion people could drown in hotness and nobody would notice. 
If you have any idea about large people, what can I say is large? But it's not that large. Five billion people is a lot of people. Evolution is responsible for what in the Indians. I mean, the Americans, the many Americans. I don't know what, what that is talking about, so I have to do some research. And it turns out, actually, that the trail, the trail of years, which is what he's referring to, the forced removal of the Cherokees, happened in 1838. Well, the origin of species, which marks the beginning of evolution of biology, was probably in 1859. That was about, what, 30 years later? How can evolution be responsible for something at the time in which it happened, evolution wasn't even around? Uh, the Great Pyramid was not built by the Egyptians. Well, don't tell that to the Egyptians, because they're very proud of it. <laughs> uh, UFOs are saving way of getting around. I don't think there's any evidence that UFOs are even around, let alone that Satan used them as, as spaceships. And why would Satan need spaceships anyway? Uh, and finally, microships will play an important part in the mark of the beast. I don't even know what that is. But probably, if you're a person uh, uh, to Bill Gates, I think probably for <laughs> So, I think there is only one reality out there. One of us is profoundly mistaken, of course, you can guess who I think is profoundly mistaken. <laughs> um, you have to decide for yourself, of course, not tonight. Uh, my main goal tonight was really to confuse your ideas as much as possible. Uh, that is the first step toward enlightenment. Once that you're not so sure of your position, then you can start going out there, go to the library, uh, read some books, read some articles, keep thinking about these things for the rest of your life, because they're not that easy. 70 year old, do not grasp these are with these topics on the spot. And neither does anyone <coughs> else for you. Um, but so you have these two choices. Innumerable scientists with legitimate PhDs who brought in the car the computer and the god on one side. Or they tell you that to go look for the evidence, speak for yourself. But look at the evidence, the real evidence. Go to a paleontological museum, go and look at, at go to the zoo even. Go and look at these things and see if it doesn't make sense to think that they are related to each other by common descent. Or, you can listen to somebody who has a clear ideological agenda. Incidentally, there is a variety of ideological beliefs among scientists. Uh, you can find anything from uh, Christians and Muslims, Buddhists, uh, atheists, agnostics, and all of that. So there is no ideological bias, which means that science is not a religion, no matter what is going to like it. On the other hand, there is a clear bias on the other side. Essentially, every single Christian that I know are not only belongs to a particular religion, but belongs to a particular subset of that religion. That seems to be a bias. And those are based on tall tales, and there's a very large price to pay for distortion or ignorance, and that, pay, that price we're going to pay as a society every single day. Um, the reason we teach evolution in public school is because it's good science. It is not perfect science, it is not the ultimate word on science, and as soon as we will know better, we will teach better. That's what happened in the past. Um, but the alternative in terms of creation is not only it's bad science, it's just not science at all. Thanks very much.
That's putting the burden of proof on us. No, he can spend his tax dollars, he can spend his money any way he wants. I don't care what he believes. I don't care how he spends his money. But he wants to spend your money and my money to teach his religion in this school. And that's what's going on, and that's what everybody objects to. You mentioned about are all the scientists fools. Um, 61% of the population believes the Earth is less than 10,000 years old and God made it. How many of you here tonight believe God made the world? Are these folks fools? Okay. Well, they haven't studied theology. They're just dumb. They're not fools. They're just dumb. That's what you're implying. When you say, when I said, are they fools? You said, no, they just haven't studied. In other words, they're dumb. That's what you're implying. That's exactly what you're saying. How many of you felt like he said that to you? There we go. Okay. Half of them. No, but well, let's see. Uh, the extinction of the dinosaur 65 million years ago, that would be interesting to talk about that for a long time. Okay, some of the uh, uh, ad hominem arguments you gave in the last rebuttal here, I'd like to address. Um, it seemed to be a blast open instead of defend evolution. <coughs> the Champ photo, the picture you showed us was Lake Champlain, not Loch Ness, okay? They're several thousand miles apart. Okay, Lake Champlain is in America between New York and Vermont. That was the Lake Champlain photo, and that has never been debunked. Okay. About a thousand people claim they've seen Champ. Discover Magazine, 1998, 38, 35 people, no, I'm sorry, 58 people watched Champ. Discover Magazine, I got the reference in here. Uh, 58 people watched Champ swim by their boat for five minutes. Reported in Discover Magazine, 98, I teach you the documentation if you'd like. Uh, there have been a lot of people who claim they've seen Loch Ness Monster, a lot of people claim they've seen Champ. I just put on my, on my website and in my seminar some of the thousands of sightings of dinosaurs that might still be alive. I have never claimed that they are. I think that they probably are if you're still alive. But I think if you listen carefully to my take without a bias, you will say, Homer treats this very realistically. He says, here's the evidence. Now you look at the evidence and decide what you want. I have personally interviewed over 60 people who claim they've seen one. I've never seen one. I've talked to 60 people who claim they have. That's as far as I go with it. How many have seen my take three about dinosaurs still living? Get it up there in the back table. I'll give you one tonight if you like one. OK. Um, you mentioned there was a link on my website about the dinosaur eating the man. Now, either you're misinformed or you're lying. There was never a link on my website. I mentioned in a seminar one time, somebody sent me an email as I was heading to a meeting, and they said, hey, did you see they found a picture of a dinosaur eating a man? I said, no, that's interesting. That night in the seminar, I said, I, somebody just sent me an email to say that they found a skeleton of a dinosaur eating a man. I haven't checked it out yet, but you might want to check out this website, and I gave the website verbally um, to that one church. The next day, somebody said, but hold on, have you checked out that website? I said, no, I just heard about it yesterday. I'll check it out today. I checked it out, found it's an April Fool. It was never on my website. Stop telling people it was, okay? All I did was one time say that I just got an email about this, and I haven't checked it out yet. That's what I said. Okay. Oh, let's see. Slinging mud, you know, it's easier to sling it than get it off of you. <laughs> you mentioned that I made a prediction that the New World Order would come May 5th of the year 2000. Now, you need to go back and watch the tape yourself, okay? I've got the documentation. I showed the cover of a book, and I said, and I, right beside it was the text. I don't have it with me anymore. I said, some people in the New Age movement a guy named Richard Noon, N-O-O-N-E, had written a book called May 5th, 2000, The Coming Ice Epic. He said that by May 5th, we're going to have the population down to a half billion, and this is going to be necessary to bring in the New World Order to get rid of some of the people that are here. All I did was say some people in the New World Order would like the population reduced to, to, to half a billion by May 5th. How I many heard me say that in my seminars over the last few years? I never said it's going to happen. I said some people in the New World Order would like it to happen. Now correct your seminar, please. Don't accuse me of saying that. I don't set any dates. I don't know when the Lord's coming back. Could be tonight. I hope so. Anyway. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned that I said 5 billion people could drown in Loch Ness and nobody would notice. Now that is just simply bad journalism or a lie. I said in my seminar, 5 billion, actually 6 billion people could drown in Loch Ness and nobody would show above the surface. That is indicating the volume of that lake is big enough to hold the entire population of the world. That is not saying nobody would notice. Now correct your seminar, please, okay? I never said that, and don't, don't accuse me of being a liar, because I, all I said was, and you check out the volume of Loch Ness, it will hold the bodies of 6 billion people. Figure it out for yourself, okay? The Trail of Tears, when the Cherokee Indians were moved out of this area right here in 1938, 
Uh, and then you mentioned, I said that, that what happened to the Indians is resp uh, largely responsible because of the teaching of evolution. Just because Darwin's book came out in 1859, you shouldn't know of anybody who teach courses on evolution. The evolution theory has been around long before that. Aristotle taught a form of evolution. He had his great chain of being in 400 BC. Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, wrote most of the uh, things that Darwin plagiarized in his own book and never gave his grandpa credit. The theory of evolution has been around since Satan in the Garden of Eden when he told Eve, you can be like God. That's what evolution says, man is evolving and progressing. And what happened to the Indians was the result of the racist philosophy that one race is better than another, and the white man's manifest destiny is to rule this continent from shore to shore, and it is directly tied in with evolution thinking that one race is better than another. The Bible says very clearly, all nations are of one blood. Read Acts uh, chapter 17, Acts chapter 2, uh, a couple other references talk about that. We all descended from Adam, and then later from Noah at the time of the flood. There is certainly no biblical reason to be a racist. The Bible offers no justification for racism at all. But if you check the history, you find Adolf Hitler killed the Jews because he thought they were an inferior species. He also hated the blacks because they hadn't evolved far enough. Paul Pott killed half of his entire population because of his belief in evolution. He was a communist. He killed half the Cambodians because he wanted to help speed up the process. Adolf Hitler had decided that blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegians, born as Lord Hilly Dog, gosh, or you betcha, he said they were the superior race. And if we could help out, we could speed up evolution by eliminating the inferiors. Evolution and racism go hand in glove. And yes, the Trail of Tears took place in 1938. I know the history about it real well. Uh, Sam Houston married one of the uh, Cherokee uh, princesses and uh, did nearly quit Congress over this issue of what they were doing to the Indians. Because, but it was because of the evolutionary mentality. Just because Darwin's book came out years later does not prove my statement is wrong. Evolution's been around long before Darwin's book came out. He just simply gave a mechanism for how it supposedly happened. That's all. You should know that if anybody. I never said UFOs are Satan's way of getting around. Watch my videotape number seven. I don't know where you're coming up with this stuff. I have on my videotape number seven what we call frequently asked questions. I also have it on my website. I speak 700 times a year. I get lots of questions asked to me. One of the questions, you got my notebook right there, UFOs, you can read my answer in my seminar notebook. I'll give you one of those if you'd like it. I said, I don't know what UFOs are. I've never seen one. I've never even talked to money, anybody who has seen one. I've read some books about the subject. I've read some interesting books about the subject. There are two theories about UFOs from a Christian perspective. One theory is that it's top secret government craft. The government works on all sorts of things they don't tell us about until you know, 20 years later, like you know, SR-71 and the, you know, the, the Blackbird and all these different top secret projects. And some people think, and I show the pictures of books you can read, some of these people think these might be demonic. Satan needs a way of getting it. He, he can only be one place at a time, whereas God can be all places at all times. And so some people think Satan might use UFOs as his means of transportation. I never said I believed it. I just said these are the two theories I'm aware of, and these are the books that talk about this. Now you go study the subject for yourself. So don't accuse me of believing something like that. I think it's getting pretty desperate when you have to resort to ad hominem attacks like you did tonight and accuse me of things, and you don't even do your research to find out if I'm right or not, or what you know what I said. I didn't say any of those things. Now that's why I much prefer a point-by-point -point discussion as opposed to have to stand up and defend myself, because we left an awful lot of things hanging about evolution theory that really ought to be discussed tonight. You mentioned in your uh, initial presentation that development is evidence for evolution. If you are implying by that that the human embryo has gill slits, I would certainly hope you're not meaning that because that was proven wrong in 1874. If that's what you're implying, then shame on you. You ought to quit your job at the university and get an honest job picking peaches for changing tires and put the seam on these kids. You're not talking about the gill slits. You think we have evidence of evolution from development of different animals. When you get time, please expound on that, because I'd like to tear that one apart very piece by piece, very slowly, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't mind standing up and defending what I believe, but if I get falsely accused, I'm going to defend myself. I think everybody has the right to do that, and I have been falsely accused tonight. How much time do we have left? We have three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Uh, you said uh, the eye, what you gave is interesting uh, What's the right word for that in, in uh, never mind, doesn't matter. You said 
about the human eye, he said it is, number one, he said it's poorly designed, therefore there are two conclusions we can come to. <laughs> Either there is no intelligent designer, or God loves octopus better than humans. This is called, I forget the term for it, maybe somebody can help me, uh, where you give two false options, neither of which is right. Who do you want to vote for, the Democrats or the Republicans? Um, <laughs> there's another option. <laughs> Uh, there's another option that maybe the designer designed it right and you don't understand why it's designed that way. I mean, that's the option you never even mentioned. So you give two options as if that's the only two, and what's the average student in this class going to think? The average student's going to leave that class mocking God, thinking God made a mistake by designing an eye with the, the blood vessels in front of the retina. The blood vessels need to be in front of the retina or you'll go blind. They block UV light. You better study it out some more. You mentioned about the whale evolving. The, I guess I need to show you the picture of that one. Um, I'll never get there in three minutes. Somebody bring that up during Q&A, please, and we'll get into the whale. The whale has little bones in his uh, pelvic region that are not used for walking on land. Uh, that is simply amazes me that anybody would still teach that. It's been proven wrong so long ago. Those little bones in the whale are used are necessary for muscles to attach to that are essential in reproduction. The whales cannot reproduce without those little bones and those little muscles. Has nothing to do with walking on land. Uh, let's see. We've got 3,500 pictures in here. It takes me just a few moments to find them. I was in a different, here we go. I was in a different program. I would have hyperlinks. Okay. Children's book on whales. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. The whale has a vestigial pelvis. Vestigial pelvis in this whole biology textbook. Here are the bones they're talking about. Go to the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History and you will see those little bitty bones hanging down right there. Yep, you can walk on land, all right, there's the proof. <laughs> those bones are essential for reproduction in whales. They have nothing to do with walking on land, they never did. And all they found for the pecky, whatever it was you mentioned about the whale, was part of the jaw and a couple of teeth. How you can tell it walked at all from the jaw and a couple of teeth, I don't know. But I think if you're going to tell your students you have evidence for evolution, you should let them decide based on the real facts, not somebody's interpretation of the facts. By the time the student gets it in the textbook, it's already been digested for them. And they're told what to believe. They're not taught how to think. They're told what to believe. That's what's happening in this university. Thank you so much. And by the way, all of my information is fed at Web Life Granted, so one of us is mine. I haven't seen your face, I've seen your website. Now, the question about who evolved first, the chicken or the egg. Um, that's a good question. And the way it usually happens is actually both. And by both, one means that structures evolve in response to some kind of a need, but the need also changes with, with the structures. In other words, the evolutionary process is an interactive process. It doesn't happen all at once, all of a sudden. All, now there is a problem. The environment poses a problem, and I have to come up with a solution. That's a simplistic way of, of thinking of evolution, which unfortunately many uh, people get exposed to in, in uh, introductory biology courses or in, uh, in high school. The real thing is, the real way it works, is that the environment changes part because it is changed by the organism that lives in that environment, and vice versa, the changed environment 
uh, provides an impetus for the change of behavior. So it's a co-evolutionary process, what's referred to as a co-evolutionary process. Now in terms of the immune system, um, I will have to give uh, the specific references to what we know about the evolution of the immune system. So if that person can email me, I can do that. Um, what happens in the case of the immune system is that there are, you can look at the evolution of the immune system simply because the immune system in humans is fairly sophisticated. In fact, the climate of the mammals in general is fairly sophisticated. But there are other immune systems across the animal world which are much simpler. And so if you look at actually some of the intermediate steps of the evolution of these systems, and that gives you a better understanding. If you're trying to understand something uh, that is at the end of an evolutionary process, or it's, it's the result of millions of years of evolution, you're not going to be able to understand that unless you think in terms of what kind of intermediate steps could have possibly brought an organism from here to there. Dr. Hogan? That's a good question. Uh, I, I think if you go back and watch the tape, anybody would agree it wasn't an ad hominem attack, it was an attack on my character. Uh, I think. And, I have my take on it anyway. If it wasn't, uh, I apologize, but I didn't take it that way. Okay. Um, what you call first the system or the need for it? This is one of millions of corollary questions that could be asked like that. What you call first the digestive system or the appetite? And if you have an appetite that can't digest the food, what good does it do? And if you have a digestive system but are hungry, what good does it do? I mean, there are millions of examples like that that could be given. And I have a whole list of those kind of questions in my seminar notebook of questions for evolutionists, which I would like somebody to answer. Uh, you can get one of those on the back table. By the way, my material is not copyrighted. You can get my material if you're a type log or a skeptic and you just want to keep your money. Well, you can, I won't loan it to you. I'll sell it to you. And after you're done, I'll write it back. You can send it back, get your money back, minus the cost of the shipping, whatever that is. So that's, that's a good deal for you there. Okay, I think those, those millions of symbiosis type systems or relationships are evidence that it could not have evolved. Thank you. It couldn't have evolved. It had to be designed. Uh, he said structure evolves Dr. Bowden, there's a question directed to you in okay. the next two minutes. Explain carbon dating and why it evolved. Two minutes. I have a, <laughs> about a 30 minute answer on my website. Uh, carbon dating is very fascinating. Uh, I've studied it quite a bit. I think that uh, people that really study the subject of carbon dating will say it's interesting. But there are too many problems with it. It does not work uh, very well, if at all. Carbon dating, I'll just give you a couple of examples in the two minutes here. I could explain how it works, if you like, with radiation striking nitrogen to create carbon-14. I think once a student understands how it works, all of a sudden the mystery is gone. And uh, then they will realize, hey, this, is, this, doesn't, this doesn't work. Um, OK, just a couple of examples here. Living mollusk shells were carbon dated 2,300 years old. Oh, they're still alive. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. Shells from living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. One part of a mammoth, carbon dated 29,000 years old. Another part was 44,000. One part of baby Nemo was 40,000. Another part is 26,000. And the wood next to it is 9,000. The lower leg of a mammoth is 15,000 years old. The skin is 21,000. I think we have a problem here, folks. Uh, I, again, I can go for a long time. They had some dinosaur bones carbon dated. They dated less than 20,000 years old. They would not have even dated them had he, had he told them they were dinosaur bones. Frozen dinosaur bones were found in Alaska. There's a, uh, uh, Answers in Genesis has a book that they sell called The Great Alaskan Dinosaur Adventure. Answersingenesis.org, you can order the book, about finding frozen dinosaur bones. If they would have said they're dinosaur bones, they never would have carbon dated them because of the preconceived idea. Evolution is a great hindrance to, to thinking, to, to, to scientific uh, advancement. Carbon dating is not how they date things. They did it with the geologic dating. One last time. Time's up. Okay. Easy with all those slides. I couldn't follow the argument. Uh, the, uh, you looked at some of, they were going very fast. You looked at some of the sources, Reader's Digest. Real good scientific. <laughs> Source for these kind of data. Now, the problem with carbon dating is that, as any other kind of dating or any other kind of tech, uh, uh, scientific technique, has a certain amount of effort, comes with a certain amount of effort, and scientists are aware of that error and they uh, therefore factor in whenever they estimate the age of something. The interesting thing about, about dating in general, not dating you know, men or women, but dating in the sense of dating rocks, is that there are several different independent ways of dating the same rock or material. And amazingly, they pretty much converge on the same results. Of course, plus or minus that, that amount of error, which is 
uh, which always comes in any time you're doing empirical science. This is one of the things that is very difficult for creationists to explain. Why is it that they do things in a variety of different ways, in, using a variety of different methods, not just carbon dating, they always come out the same, and the oldest rocks come out to be billions of years old. You can't date the oldest rocks with carbon dating because carbon dating is valid only for uh, fairly recent events. Uh, carbon decays too, too rapidly, essentially, to do that. Thank you. You guys look right the mic. Dr. Kaplucci, why doesn't the theory of macroevolution contradict the second law of thermodynamics? It does not. Um, no physicist, not only no biologist, but no physicist has ever claimed that the second principle of thermodynamics contradicts evolution. It certainly does not. The second principle of thermodynamics simply says that in a closed system, uh, left to itself, the amount of disorder, which is then technically known as entropy, will increase. Right? Um, the Earth and the biosphere is not a closed system, it is an open system, because it receives both energy and material from outside, from the, from the sun and from the rest of the solar system, so the second principle is not violated. Now, probably in the other creations will tell you, well, yeah, but energy by itself has never happened to help anybody. If you get zapped by a, a, a lightning, which is energy, what happens if you, you don't evolve, you die. Yes, that's very cute, except that it's got nothing to do with the matter at hand. The point is, the second principle of thermodynamic applies to systems that are not the living systems. Therefore, to say that the second principle of thermodynamics uh, uh, is uh, proof against evolution is simply not understanding the second principle of thermodynamics. And by the way, let me make a final comment about, about not understanding and not studying. When someone doesn't understand something because he hasn't studied that something, it's not that person is not dumb. That's not the definition of dumb by any dictionary that I know of. It's just the definition of a person who has invented that particular or studied that particular field. I'm extremely dumb in particle physics by that definition, simply because I haven't studied particle physics. I don't consider myself a dumb person, it's just that I haven't studied that topic. Thank you. All right, uh, if we have time, I go back and show you every slide I gave on carbon dating. None of them were for Reader's Digest. So either you are misinformed or you're lying. Now, if you're being a skeptic, you don't believe there's a God, it's okay for you to lie. I believe there's a God, I'm gonna stand before someday. I'll put it back up on screen. Reader's Digest? Yeah, oh, the carbon dating. I had there from Science Magazine. Look at that. Look at the second. I'll cover it in that, sir. On top of the time. Okay, you assume that adding energy will overcome the law, the second law, the second law of thermodynamics. They say the universe is a closed system, and adding energy is destructive. Folks, the universe is a closed system. Adding energy is destructive. The Japanese added lots of energy to Pearl Harbor didn't organize a thing. We turned around and left around and added lots of energy to Japan and didn't organize a thing with the atomic bomb. Uh, adding energy does not organize a thing. Adding energy to the sun adds energy to the earth. It destroys the roof on your house. It will eventually destroy the house. It will destroy the roof on your car. It will destroy the paint job on your car. Sunlight is destructive to everything except chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is an incredibly complex design mechanism to utilize the sunlight. So, second law of thermodynamics does apply, and evolution violates that. And if we have time, let's write two go point by point instead of these dumb rules. Um, we'll we'll time, uh, time, time is up. Thing, yes. See? You may as well keep the mic there. Pardon? You may as well keep the mic. The next, keep the mic, okay. Next question to you. Doesn't it take longer than 6,000 years to form a diamond? Doesn't it take longer than 6,000 years to form a diamond? Uh, Superman does it in a few seconds. Uh, it either takes lots of time or lots of pressure. Most diamonds are found in what's called blue ground, which is in the neck of extinct volcanoes. Uh, the volcano puts an enormous amount of pressure out, asking folks to live near Mount St. Helena. Uh, blows rocks the size of this building, you know, several miles away. So I think probably diamonds were formed uh, from coal near volcanoes. That's my theory on that. I don't know that anybody knows for sure how diamonds are formed. They're certainly carbon. Uh, a different crystal of carbon, like graphite and uh, uh, other forms of carbon are found on Earth. So my theory would be probably the diamonds formed at the time of the flood as the mountains of the deep were broken up and the pressure was exerted from the volcanoes uh, squirting magma through these various areas. I, I, would, I would be willing to discuss that and willing to study it. I don't know an answer, that's just my answer. It either takes lots of time or lots of pressure. I think lots of pressure would do it just as well. Okay? And I work with that Superman thing, and I stand over here. Um, this is amazing. This is this is the thing that is, that is amazing about this kind of debates. Of course, you know, you realize here that you're getting the short truth by a long, by a long stretch. 
we're just flying things at you very rapidly. Yeah, no way, Dell, if we're telling you, we know what we're talking about or something. Obviously, at least one of us doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, <laughs> geologists would not only claim but the scare and listen to the <laughs> For the formation of diamonds. But of course, we all know the geologists are a bunch of dumb people who just got a PhD in geology and that uh, 70 year old would understand how diamonds are formed in 6,000 years. Um, that's the message you were getting tonight um, over and over. Next question. Dr. Bridge, where is the empirical evidence for a chemist or physicist producing a living being from a non living being, i.e., spontaneous generation? Right. Okay. Um, before I answer that, let me get back to this recurring theme that has been brought up several times of the format of the debate. We agreed to the format of the debate weeks ago. Um, so we wanted to, to change the debate uh, five minutes before we started. That is a little bit unfair. It's not exactly fair tactic. That is why I said we'll stick to the regional debate. Next time you want to do a point by point, I'll be very happy to do that. Now, the question was about, oh, the origin of life from non-life. As I said before, we don't have an answer to that. We don't know how life originated. We have some theories, we have some pretty good theories, uh, we have scant empirical evidence, and there are a lot of people, bright people, uh, that are actually spending a lot of time working on it. Does that mean that uh, evolution is, is wrong? No, it does not. As I said before, evolution is going to have to do with the origin of life. It also doesn't mean the science is wrong. I mean, people have to get out this idea, which unfortunately is inculcated in their minds since by, by, by high school teaching, uh, that science is a body of knowledge that is absolutely complete, perfect, we know everything that, that has been done in, 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 in about the universe, and therefore we're just here to explain to you. Science is an ongoing dynamic process. We are learning things and we're trying to understand things as we go. As you asked the question like that about a century ago, for example, on um, you know how do plants reproduce, uh, the answer would have been, I don't know. Because a century, about a century ago, nobody knew about pollen and nodules, okay? Uh, about a century later, we do know. Uh, and he asked a question like this about 120 years ago, or 150 years ago, about what are genes, nobody would know even what you were talking about. Uh, nobody knew anything about the hereditary mechanisms and the hereditary material. Today we know. So come back in 100 years, and maybe I'll have an answer to the origin of life question. But I may not, so what? Uh, that is the nature of science. It's not about final answers. You find final answers only in books that you find you know, in the National Enquirer uh, magazine, but not, not in science. All right, I solved the mystery. Science Magazine, Antarctic Journal, Science Magazine, uh, Geological Professional Paper, Geological Professional Paper, Natural History. Um, I, don't have, I don't have a quote for that one. The picture is from Reader's Digest. The quote is not. I keep track of where I get my pictures from, okay? I try to document everything just so this type of thing doesn't happen. I never said any of these quotes are from Peter's Digest. So concerning spontaneous generation. I know, but see, I gotta go back and defend myself, or he's gonna go and tell everybody I believe Superman makes diamonds, okay? Uh, <laughs> the picture was from Peter's Digest. Spontaneous generation doesn't happen. Evolutionists have to believe in it. He has no other choice. Because he doesn't want God, so I don't know what to do, I think, is the problem. What mechanism limits microevolution to keep it from working on a macroevolutionary level? What mechanism limits microevolution? Well, the Bible clearly says the animals will bring forth after their kind. The kinds, apparently those that originally were able to bring forth, reproduce. Now they may have diversified to the point where they don't normally reproduce. Lions and tigers don't normally breed, but they might have got a common ancestor. They have been bred in captivity. A liger and a tiger have been produced, depending on which one is the father or the mother. Uh, even a dolphin and a whale, killer whale, were crossed, and they got a wolfen. Uh, one of the zoo, I think San Diego Zoo or Hawaii Zoo, so one of them had them. Anyway, I think the mechanism is a genetic code that simply prevents them from crossing. For instance, humans have 46 chromosomes, chimpanzees have 48. So does tobacco, by the way, it has 48. That proves tobacco and chimpanzees are identical twins. Uh, <laughs> I know I'm not saying I believe that. I'm making a joke, folks, okay? I don't believe that. Uh, uh, I think if you read in my seminar notebook, I've got a chart showing the chromosome numbers of different various animals. It's kind of a spoof on uh, evolution, showing that it doesn't follow the predicted pattern. Uh, I think there is a probably a DNA mechanism that prevents this uh, crossing of different kinds. 
That's designed in truth. God said the rain poured after the kind. There's never been an exception to that. It's interesting that creationists will keep coming up with the word kind, which is not a biological term of any sort. Anytime that I ask the creationist to define exactly what does he mean by kind, I don't get an answer. Um, how many kinds were of Noah's Ark, for example? Um, you want to guess? Probably about 10,000, I guess. 10,000. If that is true, from 10,000 kinds we got the several million species of, of organisms that are living today on Earth, you believe in a heck of a lot more evolution than I do. <laughs> in the biological theory between micro and macroevolution. Macroevolution is simply microevolution writ large over a very long period of time. There is no, no difference that, that anybody can figure out, and I still haven't had a creation to be able to, to tell me what the difference actually is. Next question. If evolution is right, what is the purpose of life? I don't know. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a philosopher. Well, I'm, I'm studying to become a philosopher. So maybe four years down the road, I might give you some hint to that. I have no idea what the meaning of life is. And if you think you have an, a, an idea of what the meaning of life is, great. Uh, my personal preferable and preferred answer is, is the movie from uh, Monty Martin. Um, that's, that's where I get my meaning of life. <laughs> that is a joke. Don't quote me on um, I don't know that biologists are now in the business of giving the meaning of life. The meaning of life is a very serious thing that every single one of us has to look for by himself or herself. And if you want to do it within a religious framework, it's great. If you can find the meaning of life within that framework, I have no problem whatsoever. That doesn't you know, uh, uh, have anything to do with evolutionary biologists. Evolutionary biologists, contrary to what they're saying, don't go around teaching atheism and don't go around teaching the meaning of life. You've got nothing to do with it. Uh, to me, it'd be a moot question because evolution isn't right. Uh, so you said, if evolution is right, what's the meaning of life? If evolution isn't right, so the question is meaningless. I think there certainly is a meaning to life. I think God designed us to have fellowship with Him. I think we were made in His image, and then today, like an old coin in your pocket gets worn out, you know, you can hardly see the image anymore. I think our image is a little, you know, worn out compared to what it used to be. Uh, not, some folks really don't resemble God at all. Uh, but that was, we were originally made in His image, and He designed us to have fellowship with Him. And I'd be glad to introduce you to him afterwards if you'd like to be Dr. Hill, what is the difference between empirical science and origin science? Empirical science deals with things that we can observe or test or measure or weigh uh, with the word empiricism, I believe. If you look it up in the dictionary, I don't have that with me now. But uh, origins really is outside the realm of science. Um, it's, it gets into the metaphysical. You have to believe in certain things. It's not observable or testable. You can't measure it or weigh it or prove it in the laboratory. So origins really has nothing to do with science. It should not be involved in any science classes. They should be in religion classes. There are various theories, uh, religious theories of how the world got here, but that has nothing to do with science. So it's a shame that, that origins is mixed with science so much. You know, beer is often sold at football games. Beer has nothing to do with football. And origins is often put into science class, but origins is not part of science. You can tell the kids, here's the, you know, the biceps, the triceps, the deltoid, the flexors, the extenders, the radius, the all that. And the kid says, how do we get here? Uh, we don't know. Let's just learn for the test. You don't, have to, you, know, you don't have to get into origins because you're going to offend somebody. If you teach evolution, somebody's going to be offended. How many of you are offended when they teach evolution? Okay. If they talk creation in the schools, somebody would be offended. How many of you would be offended if they talk creation in the schools? See, it's a subject you can't please everybody, so leave it up to schools. <coughs> How about if you have anything else about the location from the school? That would make a lot of people very happy. The question uh, was the origin, what is the difference between the right and the three origins? That distinction that we found as, as uh, just proposed is actually a fairly naive distinction from the point of view of science. Science doesn't work that, in a, such a simple way. There are certain limits to what science can do, by, by all means, there's no question about it. But some of the origin questions do fall within the limits of science. Let me give you an example. You say, well, if you can't test it empirically, if you can't do experiments on it, then it's not science. Well, by that uh, same, let me give you an analogy. By the same kind of reason, you would never be able to tell who murdered somebody else looking at the clues, because you were not there, you did not see it, there's no experiment, you can do it, you cannot replicate it, you cannot do anything else about it. Except, you can look at fingerprints, you can look at DNA evidence, uh, you can look at the circumstances of, uh, of, the, of the crime. You can look at whether the person is suspected to, be, to do the crime actually was at that time, and so on and so forth. That is, forensic science works by clues, 
by indirect proofs that we lead to reasonable conclusion beyond reasonable, beyond reasonable doubt. That's exactly the same way in the science works. Dr. Kaglucci, can you tell us when or how plants evolve from animals or vice versa, i.e., when did an animal or a plant give birth to the other type? <laughs> okay. Uh, no, plants did not evolve from animals. Uh, the closest group to animals, uh, phylogenetically speaking, that is in the history of uh, life, is actually a fungi. That's not to say that a fungus all of a sudden became a mammal. Uh, that's the way of a simplistic way of putting it. It's just that they share a very distant ancestor. As far as the when, I think the best estimate that we have at this point is about one and a half, about one billion years or eight hundred million years ago, less than a billion years ago. Uh, now, when you think of animal in that sense, as I said, you don't think of a mammal, you don't think of an animal with skeleton, human, you don't think of a worm. It's what make way to complicate what you're thinking of, which you should be thinking of, uh, are cells, which are structures, unicellular organisms, which are structured one way or the other. Um, the, the unicellular organs that gave origin eventually to the animal lineage uh, share a most common ancestor with the same organisms, so unicellular organisms that share, um, that gave origin to fungi. <laughs> that is not to say that fungi all of a sudden translate to human beings or bananas into uh, mammals or things of that sort. Can you tell us when or how plants evolve from animals or vice versa? When or how plants evolve from animals or vice versa? Well, it didn't happen. God made the plants on day three, he made the animals on day six. He designed them uh, for their you know, functions of things that they do. Uh, I think if we go back and listen to the table, we'll find Dr. Pigliucci did, did imply very strongly that fungi and animals have a common ancestor, but it didn't happen quickly, it happened slowly. Now, if you're from Harvard, of course, that happened quickly. Like Stephen Gould says, you know, punctuate the equilibrium. So uh, if you want to believe that, you're welcome to believe that. That's not science. That's not empirical. Nobody's ever, fungi are still around today. Okay, why don't they do it again? Let's evolve another, something else. Let's evolve another animal from fungi. You, uh, you've got plenty of research money, you ought to be able to do that in your laboratory. Okay. Dr. Hope, how do you explain dinosaur extinction? How do I explain dinosaur extinction? I would say they're probably not even extinct. There's probably a few still around. Uh, I think that the, in the flood in the days of Noah, <coughs> millions of animals drowned and plants and everything else. The flood explains the coal, the coal we find in nice neat layers all over the world, uh, pressed plants. I mean, layer, there's a layer in Wyoming, uh, 10,000 square miles in the uh, powder buff, buff basin, whatever it's called. And some places, 200 feet thick. I think the flood is the only explanation for the fossils at all. I think animals don't fossilize unless they're buried. And I think what happened to the dinosaurs after the flood, those that survived by being on Noah's Ark, probably babies, of course, people killed them. All through history, there are stories of people killing dragons. They called them dragons until 1841, when the word dinosaur was coined by Sir Richard Owen. There was no such word as dinosaur until 1841, so people were killing the dragons, and uh, most of them exterminated by man. Possibly if these dragons are still alive, they're mentioned in ancient history, they find them on all kinds of ancient pottery, artwork shows pictures of dinosaurs, cave paintings, cliff paintings. There's overwhelming evidence that they've lived with man. I'll cover that on video number three. Sorry, I call over. Um, the dinosaurs probably went extinct because of, of an impact of an asteroid. We have found a crater. The crater uh, is still visible underwater outside of uh, Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Uh, there, are, there is geological evidence of the impact of that crater, and the, the uh, material that that uh, uh, meter was made of was actually scattered all over the world. There are beautiful uh, geological strata in Italy, for example, where I was born, where um, that, uh, that show the same exact sequence and the same exact material as in the Yucatan Peninsula. All of these data are very difficult, not impossible, to explain with an immigrationist uh, perspective. Um, and dinosaurs don't walk the earth right now. Just please find one and bring it here, and then I'll believe it. Dr. Kaglucci, how does the Triceratops example prove evolution when, there are, when they are all variations of the same animal? Well, that's a matter of, 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 of opinions, I guess. No, they're not a variation of the same animal. What do you mean by variation of the same animal? Was that a kind? Um, Biology is considered those very different species. In fact, some of those animals are uh, grouped in the, into different genera, which is a higher taxonomic category uh, of biological uh, explanations. So, no, they're very different animals, but not only that, that, that tree that I showed you, of course, goes back further than when I showed you, so it links back to other things that don't look at all, like uh, triceratops. 
Uh, there are other kinds of dinosaurs. And there are intermediate fossils. Now, does that prove evolution? Science is not about proof. And that's another uh, myth that, that unfortunately is very common and widespread. <laughs> Science is about our best ideas, our best uh, explanation of how the evidence comes together. So, the best explanation that we have for the, uh, for the uh, diversification of Triceratops is that they were related to each other. Uh, by the way, to say that because the fungi are around there today, so the thing that uh, couldn't possibly have evolved like, from the by fungi, is the same as saying that you can possibly be your mother's son because your mother is still around. Doesn't make any sense. How does the Triceratops example prove evolution when they are all variations of the same animal? The Triceratops example that he gave is uh, different reconstructions of different bones that have been found. Probably there are a variety of, uh, there were a variety of Triceratops. There's a variety of dogs. I think if nobody would question that a great man and a chihuahua had a common ancestor. But they look awfully different. Um, as far as you said, you've asked a question that's never been answered. I want to answer it so you can't say that anymore. What is the kind? The Bible says very clearly the animals will bring forth after their kind. So those that originally were able to bring forth, that is, reproduce children, are the same kind. The Bible kind is those that can bring forth. I said, I you asked me to answer the question, how many animals are on the ark? I picked the numbers at about 10,000, and you said, I believe in fast revolution or something. Yeah. Okay. You believe all the animals in the world, including all of us, came from a rock. You believe in something that's pretty hard to believe in, from my opinion. Okay. I don't believe the Triceratops evolved from anything. There might have been a, there might have been a variety of Triceratops. There's hundreds of varieties of birds, hundreds of varieties of dogs. There might have been from hundreds Thank of varieties you. of Triceratops. No. How do you explain Mendelian genetics? Say that one. Minute. How do you explain Mendelian genetics? Oh, great, great. The priest who did the study on the uh, pea plants and all sorts of things, you know, the tall ones and the yellow ones and the green ones, he really proved that evolution can't happen. He proved that it's all part of a gene code that is locked in. You know, you can crossbreed your pea plants and you're always going to get peas, you're never going to get corn or tomato. And Mendel proved that it's, it's limited to the genetic code that's already built in. Uh, Dr. Pigucci is, is a plant biologist. He should have, uh, if anybody does, uh, should have some kind of evidence of one plant turning into a totally different kind of plant. The monocot, dicot, and tricot is not a different kind of plant. <clears throat> um, Mendel, I think, demonstrated very clearly that evolution doesn't happen. But Mendel's work was kind of ignored for 50 years because Darwin's work was so popular at the time that everybody kind of ignored Gregor Mendel at the same time. It's interesting to note that every geneticist that I know of is perfectly convinced of, the, of, the, of evolutionary theory. It doesn't have any problem with evolutionary theory. If you understand what, what Mendelism is about, there's no contradiction at all. First of all, Mendelism simply explains how organisms inherit their traits, period. Uh, then there are things that are called mutations, for example, that change the genes. And those are inevitable because you do need Mendelism in order to have evolution. One of Darwin's problems was that, unfortunately, he didn't read uh, the, uh, Mendel's paper. The reason was because Mendel published in a very obscure journal. That's one of the problems that every scientist know, knows about. Never publish in an obscure journal because then otherwise you're going to be forgotten for 30 years after you, until after your death. Um, Darwin, in fact, was looking for a mechanism for, for uh, of He needed a mechanism of editing. There's a chapter in The Origin of Species uh, that actually, in which he actually says, you know, this is one of the problems of my theory at this point. I don't know how it works. Well, now we do. That's the way science works. <coughs> Dr. Kuchy, after all this Huxley, one of the world's leading evolutionists, once claimed that, quote, the reason that we evolutionists jumped at the idea of evolution was because we did not want the God interfering with our sexual mores, end quote. If evolution is purely science, please explain why Dr. Huxley would make such a statement. I can't attest to the veracity. Yeah, you're the historian here. I'm not sure that Dr. Huxley ever said something like that. If he did, that's his own opinion. Um, it's got nothing to do with, at all with the evidence for evolution, and, and, uh, which is entirely independent of the opinions and particular uh, uh, religious beliefs or ethical beliefs of any scientist. As I said before, uh, scientists never to have an enormous variety of religious beliefs. There are scientists of all sorts of religions or non-religions. 
Uh, so if Heinzman said that, and I'm really not sure, I think I suspect this is one of those examples, those cases like uh, the alleged recantation of Darwin on, on his deathbed, uh, which probably very likely didn't happen and was made up at the beginning of the century. You should know something about it because you wrote a book in which that, um, that is reported. So I suspect that it's simply not true. But even if it is true, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, any single evolutionary biologist can think that all you want about uh, morality, God, or, or any other topic that you like, it doesn't make you an expert in that area. I think I have seen the quote, I don't remember where, I think I could find it though, if the person who asked the question wanted to contact me. I think it was uh, Thomas Huxley who said, we've accepted uh, Darwin's theory not because of the evidence, but because it gives us sexual freedom, something to that effect. I, I think I could find that. There's a book we have on the table up there called The Revised Quote Book. No, no, sorry, no. That the words may be used against it, which contains thousands and thousands of quotes from scientists from all the ages, and there's a CD in the back, which you can look at very quickly on the CD. Uh, you probably find it on there. Okay, so uh, I think it's pretty obvious if evolution is true, you have no basis to determine right from wrong. There's no absolute moral authority. If evolution is true, Hitler was right. Uh, Hitler was certainly trying to uh, promote the evolutionary uh, theory. You can read many, many folks who've written about him and say, yeah, that was his goal. I ask people this question all the time. Maybe you've got an answer, Dr. Gabriel If evolution is true, how do we determine right from wrong? Where is the standard to determine right from wrong? If evolution is true. If evolution is true, the strongest survive. It's tooth and claw, struggle for life. And the biggest guy, you know, wins. Uh, but if the Bible is correct, then God decides right from wrong. And some people don't like that idea because it chaps their mind. Next now, question. Get some Vaseline, man. You're going to need it. We'll be judged by God. <laughs> What is the purpose of the other planets and stars? What is the purpose of the other planets and stars? Uh, I don't claim to know the answer. I have a couple ideas. I'm sure I'll get misquoted on this one, too. Uh, the planets certainly do shield us from an awful lot of meteor strikes. I mean, if you take a look at the moon, obviously it took the hits for us quite a few times, uh, as well as Mercury. I think maybe the stars and planets are out there for the oh wow factor. Why do people put chrome on their cars? <laughs> People go, oh wow. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. When I step outside and look at the stars and the planets, I say, wow, what a, what a mighty God we serve. Yeah. So that may be the purpose. It may just be for this God's not in the throat. He didn't cost him a thing to make it. He didn't even lift his finger to make it. He spoke. Yeah. Everything in the universe was created by the voice of God. When he speaks, the waves lay down, the dead come to life. You know, everything obeys yeah. the voice of God. Except. Some people, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it would have been much easier to put a bunch of light bulbs up there um, and not waste all of that uh, precious energy and matter. And by the way, how would you explain, based on that hypothesis, the fact that the overwhelming majority of stars are simply invisible? How would you go, wow, something you can't see? Amen. Anyway, um, <laughs> the question was the reason why the stars and planets are there. I don't know. Nobody knows if there is a reason. First of all, the question, the question assumes that there is a reason. There may not be a reason. As far as I know, there may, there may not be a reason. If there is a reason, it's certainly not something that an evolutionary biologist would ever be able to tell you, for one thing. Uh, you should ask it at most a cosmologist. And even a cosmologist would <coughs> think it would have, it would have some, some uh, problems telling you anything about meaning. Science is not about meaning. Meaning, you have to find it yourself. Science cannot give you that answer. Next question. Monkeys evolved into humans as a result of unfavorable environments. Why do monkeys continue to exist? The grandmother, in fact, already answered that question. I think, could we go for another one or do you want to give an answer to that? Please name some absolute evidence for evolution. <laughs> absolute evidence for evolution. Well, I don't know what that means, actually. Absolute. Well, I don't know. The fact that uh, the HIV virus is changing under your buddy nose is pretty absolute to me. Um, that is a sign, yes, the virus hasn't turned into a banana yet, but nevertheless, it is evolving under your buddy nose. Uh, the fact that you might have problems getting of infections because antibiotics have selected by natural selection for more and more resistant uh, bacteria is another example of a pretty absolute you know, for yourself. <coughs> Uh, the fact that you cannot spray any more um, uh, pesticides in, in your garden and get it uh, clean of uh, pests because pests have evolved resistance. Well, that's evolution happening in the urban area, so I can see that pretty convincing evidence. 
Uh, there's many, a lot more than that. You can look at the DNA synthetic uh, uh, organisms. The fact, how do we know that fungi and animals are more closely related to each other than either one of them is related to plants? Because if you look at their molecular structure, their DNA today, it is much more similar than either of them, of them is to plants. I would say there is no absolute evidence for evolution above the microevolution examples which I gave earlier. Now let me take the rest of my one minute on the stars. The Hubble telescope was asked to look for 10 days at one spot that it thought was black. After 10 days of viewing, a spot about the size of a grain of sand held an arm's length above the Big Dipper. They discovered after analyzing the pictures there were more stars than they could count in that area. And I said the same thing. Wow. That's what I said a minute ago. That's for the oh wow factor. And it worked. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Your turn. If we all come from Adam and Eve and sons of Noah, how do we have different races? How do we have different races? I guess studying this for quite some time, I've, I've come to the conclusion races is a bad term. Uh, we have different colors of people. I think it's uh, very divisive to talk about different races. Uh, and I've got that answer on video. Uh, like I said, I have uh, 3,500 pictures. I can't call it up quickly. There are several different theories of where the different skin colors came from. Uh, I tend to believe probably the Tower of Babel after the flood is, is the most likely theory. Uh, about 200 years after the flood, there were probably a few thousand people in the world by then. And uh, they were decided to build this tower, you know, in, to, in spite of God's commands to get out and spread out and replenish the earth and all that stuff. And so they decided in rebellion to God to build this tower. God came down and confused their languages. The people had to go off then marrying somebody from their own family. Now, in the original creation, this would not be a problem with a pure genetic code. He married sisters with no problem. Adam married his rib with no problem. Uh, <laughs> but after the flood, you would start to have problems, genetic problems. And today we have 3,500 defective genes. And it was just about genetic suicide to marry somebody closer than a first cousin. So probably after the flood, the Tower of Babel, they broke up. Everybody speaking French went one way. Everybody speaking Italian went someplace else, and the Germans, and et cetera, et cetera. And they had to marry family. And under those conditions, like the Habsburg dynasty, you start to get some pretty weird-looking rednecks after a while. Um, so I suspect that the races probably came as a result of the inbreeding a few hundred years after the flood. Tower of Babel, that's one of four possible explanations from Scripture. That beats believing all the races came from a rock by a long shot. I wish you would stop saying that. No evolutionary biologist believes that we come from a rock. Um, but anyway, the other thing to do is you realize, you realize that he's making it up as we go. I mean, what does it mean to have a pure genetic code? That's not a biological term. I don't know what a pure genetic code is. And in fact, one of the problems with the Adam and Eve story is exactly the man in your rib is not really a good idea. Um, your children are not going to be in good shape. So I don't even know what the, the, the pure genetic code is. I, it, there's no such thing. Genetic code is genetic code. Genes are genes. There's no such thing as a pure or an impure gene. Genes are different from each other because of mutations. Some of them work better than others. But they're not pure or, not pu or impure. There is, there's, it's, just, it's not a genetic term. What mechanism would you propose to insert new information into the genetic code? Mutation seems unable to do this. I'm so glad somebody asked that question. First of all, mutations do that, because a mutation is, by definition, a change in information, therefore, in, uh, encoding the genetic code. Therefore, you do have new information, meaning that you have information that is different from what was there before. If by new information you mean additional information, additional quantity of information, uh, there are several uh, mechanisms that do that. Uh, they go under the names of gene duplication, and chromosomal duplication, and polyploidy. These are observable under laboratory conditions. You can come to my lab and do it yourself uh, in a few days or a few weeks. You can actually multiply genes and multiply by natural occurrences, not, not by artificial means. You can observe genes duplicating themselves, and you can observe chromosomes multiplying into organisms uh, in a way that then they become stable. They, 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 they have added, essentially, genetic information. So adding genetic information is not the problem. The real question is, what do you do with that genetic information? That's where natural selection comes into play, and it screens out things that don't work very well and keeps things that work a little better. Uh, incidentally, natural selection is not uh, an optimizing, what's called an optimizing mechanism, that is, it doesn't produce perfect things. Um, Sometimes evolution is called the, the uh, survival of the fittest. 
a better metaphor is the survival of the barely tolerable. If you're good enough to survive, then you're, then you're in. And if you're not good enough to survive, then you're out. OK, uh, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution, Pierre Grasse says, who's a strong believer in evolution. Mutations are a re-scrambling of gene code. It doesn't give you any new information. Polyploidy, as you should know, if anybody being a plant bi botanist, who, th that just simply doubles existing information. It doesn't give you new information. It's a copy of the original code. This bull, for instance, have five, has five legs. No new information has been added. He has a copy of a leg put in the wrong place. That's not new information. Here's a, a short-legged sheep. No new information added. This is a mutation. Two-headed turtle. There's no new information. It's a doubling of information. That is not evolution, and it's not ninja. It's just a mutant turtle. Uh, it's scrambling. This biology textbook shows the kids a mutant fly. It says normal flies have two wings. This mutant has four. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Well, excuse me, but uh, why didn't they show us a beneficial mutation? Nobody's ever proven one. And if you did have a beneficial mutation, who would it marry? And who would the grandkids marry and the great-grandkids? You've got a real serious problem here. Nobody's ever proven a beneficial mutation. And scrambling information that already exists is not creating new information. And doubling the cop copying the code, I I'm embarrassed that you would say polyploidal is an example of new information. You, of anybody, should know it is not new information. Dr. Hoven, you acknowledge that variations exist in creationist view of the origin of life, i.e. zebras, horses. All life began 6,000 years ago. Where is the evidence of the birth of these variations? Surely someone would have witnessed the birth of a zebra from a horse or the Great Dane from a Chihuahua. You, the question is a little convoluted and confusing. Start again. OK. You acknowledge that variations exist in creationist view of the origin of life, i.e., zebras and horses. All life began 6,000 years ago. Where is the evidence of the birth of those variations? Surely someone would have witnessed them. Uh, I don't think there's any question that variations happen. The question is, how far can it go? As far as the horse and the zebra having a common ancestor, I don't know when it happened, or even if it happened, I suspect that it could have happened. And that would be a legitimate field of research for scientists. Uh, but then to conclude that horses and bananas are related, uh, is way beyond the observable evidence. And I, can sh I showed you from the textbooks, they do teach the kids, we all came from a rock. That's what it boils down to. I know you, I know you don't like me saying that. Well, uh, you ought to get rid of that dumb theory and I wouldn't have to say it. Uh, variations happen, but they have limits, okay? Farmers breed for bigger pigs, but they're never gonna get a pig as big as Texas. Roaches become resistant to pesticides, but they will never become resistant to a sledgehammer, okay? <laughs> Yes, variations happen, but they're limited, and they always produce the same kind of plant or animal. That's not evolution. And the information for the variation is already present in the gene code. Nothing new is ever added. The gene pool of the new variety is now more limited. Somebody spent years developing a chihuahua. All that work to make a 100% useless dog. <laughs> Genetic information is lost when you get a variant. Ask any farmer that raises anything. The further you get away from the norm with your hybrid, the more problems you start to have. Either disease resistance goes down, or like the Great Danes, or many dogs have hip dysplasia, you get problems. You might get one desirable trait, like a cow that gives more milk, but you always get some other problem someplace else. And if you turned all the dogs in the world loose back into the woods, 90% of the varieties we have today wouldn't survive. Up in Alaska, probably the, you know, the long-haired ones would survive, and in the desert, the short-haired dingoes would survive. But you're always going to have a dog. That, that's, not, that's not new information. Uh, you did say that 10,000 species gave origin to millions of species in the last 4,000 years. So that, that uh, question was right. Somebody must have observed that uh, happening one, one of those uh, times at least. It is also very interesting that um, you keep saying that nobody has ever observed the origin of a new species. That is absolutely not true. Uh, there are some examples in the biological literature of direct observations of the origin of new species, both in animals and in plants. Since you've cited your uh, tapes and, and, uh, and uh, books several times tonight, let me quote mine once, once in a while. There is a table there with references that you can check out of the species, some examples of the species that have actually been observed within historical time, within the last 100 years or so. So speciation, origin of new species, does occur. Um, it's, it's a myth that it does not. Um, 
I think that's about it for okay. that question. Next question. There's been no mention as to why an eyeball would evolve in the first place. In the absence of a creator or designer, an organism would have to realize that there was a capacity for sight without prior knowledge of it or evidence for it. How can an organism therefore develop sight? No, that, that doesn't work that way. Um, the, the eye originated as a single, uh, very simple pigment that is sensitive to light. You might not think of that as an eye, but if it makes a difference, if you're a microorganism, you're a unicellular organism, you have this little pigment, which is a very simple molecule, by the way, it doesn't require much complexity, and that pigment tells you, look, there is light over there and there is darkness over there, and um, guess what? Food is actually usually related to, to light, then you better swim that way. Well, that little pigment is going to make the difference for you between life and death. Uh, so eyes don't evolve overnight. They don't evolve because organisms know that they need eye, eyes. As I said before, it is a co-evolutionary process between the organism and the environment. So you start with ten, tiny little steps, tiny, tiny little things which are very simple, and then you become more and more complicated because, in fact, guess what? Once that I can tell if there is light over there and darkness over here, it might be advantageous if a, a mutation in that, in that pigment or in the structure in which the, that pigment is actually housed will tell me not only that there is light versus non light, but it tells me that there is more light in one direction and less light in the other direction, meaning that it's capable of, of detecting a gradient. From there on, if you can form very simple images, very, very blurred ones, it's very advantageous because any image is better than nothing, and so on and so forth. You keep going that way. By the way, this process has been simulated in, under computer conditions, um, and it turns out that the intermediate steps that have been predicted by evolutionary biologists are exactly what a computer simulation will give you uh, if you don't give the program any prior knowledge of where you want to end up at, at the end. That's pretty interesting uh, indirect evidence that the eye evolved that way. The other evidence, which is more direct, you can actually look at many of the intermediate steps because many of the organisms living today still have the intermediate steps. You can find a bunch of, of uh, uh, gradations of complexity in the eye. It's not that every organism on Earth has a complex eye. Okay, you misqu misquoted me twice last time. I never said there were 10,000 species on the ark. Get it right this time. I said there are 10,000 kinds. Kinds. Very, very important distinction. Okay. And I never said nobody has ever observed a new species. I never said that. Nobody's ever observed a new kind. You got it? Good. Okay. Now, let's go to the eyeball here. Charles Darwin said, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. This textbook says the complex structure of the human eye may be the product of millions of years of evolution. This one says, I'll blow it up for you a little bit here, you can better understand how the eye might have evolved if you picture a series of changes during the evolution of the eye. This is exactly what he said a moment ago. You have to picture it. You have to imagine it. It doesn't take place in reality. You have to imagine how it happened. Imagine an animal with a, a spot that is sensitive to light. That gives him an advantageous, you know, uh, an advantage over those that don't have this spot. And therefore, he's going to survive and the rest are going to be killed. See, evolution is based on death. One animal evolves a little better than the rest. The rest have to die in order for that one with the spot to take over the population. Evolution is based on the idea that death is wonderful, death is good, death's how we get ahead, the bad ones have to die. Thank you. That's exactly the opposite of creation. The Bible says God formed the eye, that's the way it happened. Next questions for you. Dr. Hovind's argument would be nullified if it could be conclusively proven that God does not exist. Please address the existence of God from a purely scientific perspective. Address the existence of God from a scientific perspective. Here's, here we have an example of uh, somebody defining the argument, and by the definition of their terms for science, of course, that the, see, they say science has to be observable, testable, demonstrable, and that's going to automatically exclude God. Well, if, if that's your, they've, they've, they've set up the parameters where it's a no-win no situation for the creationist. I think that uh, we have the same situation for those who teach evolution. They believe in the existence of all sorts of things. They believe there are beneficial mutations, though nobody's ever proven one. They believe an animal can produce a different kind of animal, though nobody's ever observed one. It's not part of science. I cannot scientifically prove the existence of God. I can tell you he changed my life a whole lot 31 years ago. Anybody else in that boat? Yeah. There's, there's my evidence right there. Changed lives. He can make the prostitute pure, make the drunkard uh, sober, and make the, make the liar quit lying. He can do amazing things. 
I would like to remind Mr. Alvin that this is a scientific debate. We are not in a church. If you want to do something like this in a church, I'll be fine. <laughs> what was the original question? Dr. Hovind's argument. Time for me. <laughs> Dr. Hovind's argument would be nullified if it could oh, be conclusively right. proven that God does not exist. Please address the existence of God from a purely scientific perspective. Right. Well, the, as I said, the existence of God, I mean, so on this one, Mr. Allen is definitely correct. The existence of God is not a scientific question. Not because, that doesn't mean that science excludes, I mean, the, the interpretation is science excludes anything that it cannot analyze. That's a fallacy, and that's a fallacy that plays in his, in his, in his uh, field, but it's completely untrue, and I don't see why he insists in, in making it. Um, the fact that something cannot be analyzed scientifically doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Okay. Our science, as far as I know, cannot analyze why certain people are so fond of the Three Stooges. Does that mean that there are no people out there that are fond of the Three Stooges? Of course not. Uh, science cannot tell me, at this point at least, why is it that I'm so fond of Monty Python. But then, nevertheless, that doesn't neg negate um, that fact. So, the fact that there are things that are outside of science, it's not equivalent to say that those things don't exist. On the other hand, I will call again on Newton's dictum. You're, you're, you're making a very extraordinary claim, so where's the evidence? Not scientific, but what kind of evidence do you have at all? Can any known organism be traced back all the way to one cell? Yeah, you were born that way. Whoever answered that question. <laughs> the process of development is not well understood. That is one of the other things. There's in, in a large number of academic journals uh, on people working with people working on uh, on developmental biology. Developmental biology is something that we know a lot about, but we know an awful lot. Uh, th there is an awful lot that we don't know about. But nevertheless, you can observe the uh, development of anything from one cell. In fact, anything, everything develops from one cell. Now, in historical times, how would that happen? Well, I don't see what the problem is there. I mean, uh, if you can see it under your nose over the span of a few hours or a span of a few uh, weeks, I don't see what the problem would be over the spans of millions of years. All you need is, for example, a unicellular cell originally that has a mutation in one and, and, and duplicates that cell without then uh, separating them. Now you have a multicellular organism, a two-cellular organism. Okay? If that gets inherited, inherited because of m the mutation was heritable, then you now have, have uh, multicellular organisms. It's not that simple. I'm, I'm simplifying the situation here, but I don't see any conceptual problem uh, with that kind of thing. Um, incidentally, this duplication or addition of, of, uh, of information, I did say that uh, polyploidy duplicates information. Then mutations come in and they change that information, which is, means that when you add together the process of polyploidy, which is chromosomal duplication, plus mutations, you have actually created new information, contrary to what you just said. <clears throat> okay. Uh, you mentioned, read the question one more time so I could phrase it right according. I hate to keep doing this to you, but he, this is the, my point-by-point point argument again. Let's go point-by-point point next time. Uh, I'm sorry, just... Can any known organism be traced back all the way to one cell? Can any known organism trace back all the way to one cell? If you mean as far as evidence that it evolved from a one-celled creature, absolutely not. What he gave was a far cry from an example of evolution. The human being starts off as one cell and becomes a man. That is because it's following a genetic code. To say, to, if that's your example of evolution, you're either confused about what evolution is, or you're trying to, again, grossly oversimplify this process. Uh, everything comes from one cell. That is because there's a code it's following, and there's an enormous intake of energy. To get my son from one cell to 22 years old and six foot tall took a huge amount of food. There was energy put into this thing. So that is not evolution. It, to, to, if you're teaching your students that that's an example, going from one cell to a fully grown human, that that's an example of evolution, you're deceiving your students because it's following a complex genetic code and it is taking in information from the outside. That is not an example of evolution like taught in the textbooks. Um, and by the way, where are the two-celled creatures in the world? It would have to go, there are millions, zillions of one-celled creatures. Where are the two-celled or the three-celled or the four-celled? They don't exist, folks, and he ought to know that. They don't exist. There are colonies that get together and do functions, volvox and stuff like that, but that's a colony of cells. Each one is still an individual cell. That's not anything similar to a tissue or an organ, and there just aren't any. Evolution falls flat, it, and you talk about Hume's dictum. You're claiming that all life forms came from one cell. Dr. You better Herbert. have some extraordinary Tom. evidence of that. 
What about divinely inspired evolution? What about what? Divinely inspired evolution. Divinely inspired evolution. I would say that would be a retarded God um, that has to use evolution. First place, there's no evidence for evolution anyway, so why should I compromise a perfectly good Bible which has never been proven wrong with a dumb theory which has never been proven right? I wouldn't want to make that trade off. And, and, and plus, I would not worship a God that has to use suffering and misfits and death and blind chance and doesn't know what he wants. The God that I worship made it right first time. No mistakes. You said that your son grew up thanks to a lot of energy. Doesn't that violate the second principle of thermodynamics? Shouldn't have been annihilated by the energy coming in? Um, now, the that was a joke. Thank you. Um, okay, the question was about what? <laughs> the question simply said, what about fun, by the way. divinely you should inspired... You try one of these days. <laughs> what about divinely inspired evolution? Oh, divinely evolution. inspired ev evolution. Well, I don't know. But you sure, could, could be. Um, yeah, you can make the argument that uh, that kind of God would be fairly wasteful. Um, but then again, you know, who are we to make the argument about God wastefulness or not? I think that was one of your objections before. So maybe we don't know. Maybe that is the best way that God can make things, and, um, and that's the way it happened. I have no idea. Um, again, evolution's got nothing to do, evolutionary biologists have nothing to say about theology. Um, if you want to believe it that way, that's fine. There's plenty of evolutionary biologists. There's a, a colleague of mine, um, Dr. Miller at Brown University, who believes exactly that. He's read, written a book, if you're interested in that, called uh, uh, Finding Darwin's God or something like that. And that's the theory that he proposes. Um, that's fine. But that you should know, reading the book, uh, that that's not evolutionary biology. That's his version of, of theology. Maybe try, right or not. Dr. Pugliucci, why do animals and humans not evolve today? They do. I tried to explain it several times. Yes, they do. Um, animals and, and humans uh, change their genetic constitutions all the time, every time, every day. Therefore, they are evolving by definition. Uh, now, the question might be, why is it that we don't see species appearing every time, every day? That's a good question. The answer to that is because the speciation process is actually pretty slow, as Darwin did, uh, did propose. But as I said before, we have observed historical events of speciation. So that's not a problem for evolutionary theory either. And it's incidentally, talking about Darwin and, uh, and uh, quoting in a, shall we say, a selective way, that uh, passage from, uh, from Darwin, from the original species, that said it may seem absurd uh, that to believe that the eye evolved by natural means. You should have smelled a rat there. The word was, it may seem absurd. You should know that if you go and check that quote, immediately afterwards, uh, Darwin goes on into half a chapter in which he tries to explain how, in fact, the eye evolved. So he says, you know, at first, at first view, at, uh, uh, it, it might seem like an absurd thing, but here it is how, in fact, it can happen, and, here is, it, and this is what evolutionary biologists have found so far. Selective quoting is pretty dangerous. Well, we're going to be here all week. Here's the quote. I have the book in the car. I'll get it out next time. He said, I, he didn't, he said, I su to suppose that the eye, uh, with all of its intricable mechanisms for adjusting to light, he has a whole bunch of descriptions of the eye in there, uh, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Go ahead and read the rest of page 217, 218, and 219, where he talks about his theory of how it might have happened, but it's all speculation. That's not science. Here's how it might have happened. That's what you did. Well, it might have happened, you know, from a one-spotted critter. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not science. As far as, was the question about why don't we see animals and humans evolving today? Is that the question we're t discussing now? Why do animals and humans not evolve today? Well, because God brought them, designed them to bring forth after their kind, and that's all, that's all they're going to do. Humans are always going to have humans. You might get a big one or a little one, but it's always going to be a human. That doesn't happen. Evolution doesn't happen. So it's, to me, I, I don't have a problem with that question. Dr. Hovind, do you, did you teach evolution when you were a teacher in high school? Were you a Christian then? I was a Christian. I became a Christian at age 16. As I taught school, I taught science, and I tried to teach all sides of the theory. If evolution was presented in the book, I would say, here's one theory. Now here's the evidence against this theory. Here they're telling the kids, you know, you have similar bone structures in your arm compared to a whale. Okay, they can interpret that to be proof of a common ancestor, or you can interpret that to be proof of a common designer. The hubcaps from a Honda Accord will fit on a Honda Prelude. That proves they both evolved from a Chevy 84 million years ago. 
No, they have similarities because we have a common designer. That's just obvious. So I taught my kids to, to study science objectively, realistically. Let's look at this and don't get brainwashed. Don't get taught what to believe. You know, learn how to really think about this. If somebody tells you the human embryo has gill slits and that proves it used to be a fish, you better study the history of that. That was proven wrong in 1874. Those little folds of skin develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. I've seen fat folks that have five or six chins and they cannot breathe through any of them but the top one. Okay? Those are not gill slits and that should not be in the textbooks. So I taught my kids to study science objectively. Okay? Sure, thanks. The, this equal time teaching thing is, is something that, that needs to be discussed. Education is not about equal time teaching. I mean, if that were the case, then you would be teaching the Copernican theory um, and the Ptolemaic theory. You would be teaching that the Earth rotates around the Sun and the Sun rotates around the Earth. That's because there are two theories. In fact, historically, they were two theories. Now, that was about 400 and something years ago. Now we know better, therefore we don't teach Ptolemaeus anymore. Uh, the day in which somebody finds out that Copernica was, was wrong, which is pretty difficult, then we'll teach something else. Uh, the same goes for creation and evolution. I mean, creation was a viable theory at one time in history. The last time that was the case was around the 1850s. After that, it has not been a viable scientific theory, which is why we don't teach it. I mean, teaching evolution, uh, teaching uh, in, in schools, not only public schools, but any school, should be about critical thinking based on the observations and the facts available. It's not about dogma. No evolutionary biologists should ever teach evolution as a dogma. And if they do, they're simply mistaken. They don't understand what, what education is all about. But it is the only viable theory at this point, scientific theory at this point. It may be wrong, perhaps. Uh, but certainly creation is not the alternative. This may have been addressed, but forgive the, or blame the moderator if it has. Do you believe, Dr. Puglucci, that the tailbone is vestigial? That the tailbone is vestigial. Oh, I see. Um, okay, yes, let's talk about these vestigial things, uh, because I know that Mr. Alvin, if I say yes, Mr. Alvin will say, well, then why don't we have, I'll pay for an for a, for a operation for your tailbone to be taken out and see how you feel. <laughs> right? I'm learning the game here. Um, okay. Now, it is very serious. You're right. But, uh, you know. Um, vestigial organ organs are not, contrary to what most people think, organs that don't have any function. Uh, if they didn't have any function, they probably would have been lost long ago. Um, these are organs that used to have a different function, and they, na they now have shifted to something else. A great example of it uh, is if you observe many uh, animals that live in caves. Animals that live in caves usually either don't have eyes or they have greatly reduced eyes. The reason for that, that's, the, that's a great example of when you find re very reduced eyes in cave animals, it's a great example of, of evolution because the reason that happens is because it costs metabolically quite a bit for the organism to build the eye. It's a complex structure, so it costs energy. Okay? And if you don't need it, then there will be natural selection against forming eyes, which is exactly what we see. So you see over a period of time, um, with all the integrations that you want, you see the eyes disappearing in cave animals, so that you can find the cave animals that have non-functional eyes and eyes that are, not a, that are only half there and all quarter there, and they're completely gone. Uh, that is the way vestigial organs work. So in the case of the uh, tailbone, it's the same situation. The tailbone doesn't, doesn't uh, function anymore as it does in other primates, that is, as a tailbone. Uh, because we don't have any tails anymore. Uh, but it does have other functions. There are some muscles that are attached to it, so you can't get rid of it entirely. But it is exactly the same bone that other animals, very close related to, uh, to us, actually use as a tailbone, which is, again, how evolution works, by changing things around gradually, little by little. Yes. Yes, sir. I certainly would pay to have yours removed any time you'd like. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you mentioned about cave animals losing their eyes, and you said this is uh, a great example of evolution. I think it should be obvious to a, a kindergartner that losing something is not evolution. That's the opposite of evolution. You're going backwards in time, okay? You're losing something, not gaining something. The textbook says the appendix is vestigial because you don't need it anymore. Well, you better study your anatomy because the appendix is part of the immune system. You can live without your appendix, that's true, but if your appendix is taken out, you have a higher susceptibility to many diseases. You could live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes also. That doesn't prove you don't need them, okay? You do need your appendix. By the way, that's not Reader's Digest. Uh, in the beginning, Walt Brown is out there, a good book to read. Uh, this one says, the whales have a vestigial pelvis. First place, I'd like to point out, there is no vestigial pelvis in a whale, okay? Those bones are necessary for reproduction, like we mentioned earlier. This book says humans have a tailbone they no longer need. 
I've volunteered many times. You, if you think it's vestigial, I'm serious. I'll pay to have yours cut out. I'll do it right now. Bend over. Okay? And it doesn't just, this proof of design, okay? We're perfectly designed. The spine has to end somewhere. Why not there? And arguing from vestigial organs is a lousy argument for evolution. First place, there aren't any vestigial organs. And if there were, that's the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. Okay, the next question for you, Dr. Hoven. Your scientific theory was proposed, it says about three or 4,000 years ago. I think they mean it was proposed concerning about three or 4,000 years ago, before we knew anything other than what we could see. How do you think they got it right, scientifically? Being are, are they referring to the Bible being written 3,000 years ago, and how do I think they got it right, scientifically? I think it's amazing that they did. I mean, there's nobody's proven anything scientifically wrong. The Bible says the earth is round. The Bible says there are currents or paths in the sea. Murray studied those based on the Bible verse in the book of Psalms and discovered the ocean currents and has saved the world billions of dollars in shipping costs. If you know something scientifically wrong with the Bible, I'd like to see it. I know thousands of things that are told in the Bible way before they were discovered. The Bible says in the book of Job from 3,000 years or 4,000 years ago that the sun causes the wind. And ask any weatherman what causes the wind currents. The sun heats up the ground, causes warm air masses to rise and, and spread out. Exactly right. The Bible has lots of scientific statements. It's not a science book, but when it deals with science, it's right. Which version of it? Of course. Now, the interesting thing about the Bible is that, of course, it's not a scientific text. I, I, nobody except creationists would, would, would argue that it is a scientific textbook. Uh, it is a very interesting historical document that was written over a long period of time by many different authors. Um, Bible scholars agree on, on, that, on that thing. And it, it is right. It, is, it, it was written by people that knew next to nothing about science. It is true that the Bible says, for example, that the earth is round in one place. But then there are a couple of other places in which it says or it implies that it is flat. And there are several other things. There's the, there are places in which the Bible says or it implies that, in fact, the earth is the center of the universe and the sun rotates around it. Is that surprising? No, because that was the theory that was held by most people at that time. It has only one problem. It's wrong. What is the evidence that the intermediate organisms are actually intermediate and are not distinct termina of lines? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, you can't, you can't, it's not that easy to tell. In fact, you can't, if you look at, a, at an organism that is intermediate, um, you cannot be sure ever, you can never be sure that that organ, organism was on direct line of descent of something else that came after or became, or came first. This is what Mr. Arvin uh, referred to as they're just dead bones problem. But that is not how science works. Again, works, science doesn't work, uh, historical science, which is what evolution biology is, doesn't work by direct observation necessarily. In some cases, you can work by direct observation. In some cases, you don't. The way it works is this. Look, if there, was, if there is a whale now, and there was this organ that, organism back there in 55 million years ago, which we think for some reason was an ancestor of the whale, then in between, you should find certain forms that look pretty much like this, like the ones that I showed you before. That is a prediction. When that prediction, that prediction can be tested and can be falsified, therefore, if, this, if, the forms, if those forms are never found, or in fact, worse, if forms that don't fit that sequence are found, that is a falsification of evolutionary theory. So um, it's not it's got nothing to do with experiment in this case because you're talking about fossils. I mean, unfortunately, fossils don't reproduce freely. Um, I've tried to put two ammonites in the same drawer and, and sound the violins, but it, nothing happens. But nevertheless, they are the intermediate forms that we do know about follow exactly the predictions of evolutionary theory. Look, sometimes I, I'm asked, how is it that, it that you could possibly falsify evolutionary theory? Find one bone of a human being or of a dinosaur in Precambrian rocks, and that will falsify evolution right there. But there, we know of millions and millions of bones in strata all over the world, and it has never been found. Dr. Hoban? Interesting. Okay. Well, again, we got six points brought up. Um, the Bible does not teach the earth is flat. The Bible says it's round. Isaiah chapter 40. The Bible does not teach the earth is the center of the universe. Uh, 
if I tell the, if somebody says I went 50 miles an hour down the highway, technically you're going 50 miles an hour down the highway, plus you're going 700 miles an hour around the Earth here at this latitude, plus you're going 66,000 miles an hour around the sun, plus the sun's going around the galaxy at a certain speed. So you lied when you said you're going 50 miles an hour. No, you gave the obvious evidence to an Earth-bound observer. The weatherman this morning said sunrise at 7.15. Was he lying? No, he's, that's the way it is to an Earth-bound observer. It looks like the sun is rising. That's not lying. Now, um, as far as uh, you're, you're saying that the whales 55 million years ago and all this stuff, you're basing everything on the assumption that that dumb geologic column means something. Those layers of Earth are given a different age. All this was done in the early 1800s, Charles Lyell, 1830. Darwin didn't like round numbers, so he said one of the layers was 306,662,400 years old. Um, but those layers are not different ages. They find petrified trees standing up all over the world, running through multiple layers of rock. Now, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. If you have petrified trees that are standing up and they're running through Thank different you. rock layers, the layers are the same age, all formed in the flood of Noah. Serendipitously, I have a related question for you. Can you explain why there are no large animal fossils in the lowest levels of sediment? Can I explain why there are no large animal fossils in the lowest layers of sediment? I.e. The, the, the oldest fossils, the sedimentary oldest fossil. layers. Okay. First place, if you found a large animal fossil in any layer, who's going to decide the age of that layer? Somebody who already has the preconceived idea that this geologic column means something? Well, if the evolutionists get to make all the decisions of what goes where, then of course the evidence is going to fit their interpretation. But I would point out that animals automatically sort based upon, in a flood, they sort based upon body density, based upon intelligence, based upon habitat, based upon mobility, and certainly based upon liquefaction. There's an interesting phenomenon that takes place when waves come by. The high part of the wave is heavier than the low part of the wave. If I knew that question was uh, coming, I could have got into that here uh, on liquefaction. I got plenty of stuff on that. But Pressing and relieving the pressure on sand. You can go down to the beach where I live in Pensacola, Florida. Just walk out a few feet and stand there. As the waves come by, the pressure exerts, uh, wa squeezes water into the sand. Then the low part of the wave comes by. The pressure is relieved, and sand is actually hopping up off the bottom. If you don't move a muscle, within a few minutes, you'll be knee-deep in sand. Liquefaction is what it's called. A guy took an aquarium full of sand, rocks, gravel, mud, grass, trees, a bunch of different things, and dead fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, mixed them all together and uh, su subjected it to liquefaction for a couple of days and it sorted them. Fish went to the bottom, birds went to the top based on liquefaction. You need to study, get the book in the beginning by Walt Brown. The flood is the best explanation for the sort sorting of the fossils we find, not some evolutionary sequence. It is very interesting that um, you keep mentioning the geological column as, as if uh, it were invented by uh, evolutionary biologists to explain um, how things work by evolution. In fact, the geological column was invented by creationist geologists before Darwin's publication of The Origin of Species. So that's pretty difficult to use it as an anti-evolution argument. Um, the other thing is I really doubt that Darwin said 3,662 blah, 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 and that quotation was from a creationist book. It was probably made up. I'd like, to sh I'd like you to show me where it was published in Darwin's uh, in Darwin's book. Um, i never seen it, but anyway, that precise, Darwin wasn't that precise, he knew better. Do you, do you quote it, could you stop the time? You quoted at one point okay. a certain figure, precise figure that Darwin has said about the, um, this I guess, the age of the This concerns sedimentary layers. Can you explain why there are no large animal fossils in the lowest level of sedimentary what, rock? What was that again? That was the original yeah. question. Yeah, but anyway, um, so the geological column is not a problem. Um, for, for, um, for evolutionary biology simply because, first of all, it is derived independently from the fossil record because you can date the rocks with absolute dating methods. And second of all, because it wasn't actually invented by creationists. And um, if we have to go back to the, to the Bible, I hate to do this, but um, quote, quotes about four corners of the earth, uh, an earth with four corners and, uh, and, and a firmament staying on pillars, that seems pretty awfully suspicious as a metaphor for a weatherman. Uh, but if you think that that's what it is, that's fine. Go ahead. How could there be transitions from plants to animals and increasing complexities in other species with no living species that is also transitional alive, specifically ape to human? I think they're looking for a living example. A living example of a proto-human. We killed them all. Um, I mean, it's pretty easy. Yeah. There are examples, of, there are plenty of examples of intermediates, by the way, of dif among different species of both animals and plants. 
Um, the human lineage is pretty small, incidentally. There are only a few species that belong to the human lineage. And that really truly is because most of them went extinct. Uh, probably the latest intermediate stage or the latest close, close relative to us, which was uh, um, Neanderthal men, um, it, it went extinct several thousand years ago, of course. And possibly one of the explanations is that it went extinct because we did kill him. Um, we are pretty good at killing, if you haven't noticed. Um, we have been directly responsible for the extinction of countless species, both in historical times and today. It's not, I'm not just blaming McDonald's. Um, it's, it's a lot of, it has been this, the history of humankind um, all over again. So, yeah, uh, if two species are very close to each other, by the way, there is an, uh, a, a very uh, well-known uh, principle in ecology that says that those species are going to be in very high competition with each other. And uh, you can actually demonstrate with laboratory experiments that the result of hi very high intense competition between forms that are very similar to each other is that one of the two is going to go down the drain. One of them is going to go extinct. So presume, pro pro very likely, well, that's what happened to other, human other proto-humans. But the fossils are still there. They're telling us the story. So I don't really see what the problem is. Um, I'm going to need that question one more time. I got lost in the shuffle here. How can there be transitions from plants to animals and, and increasing complexities in other species with no living species that is a transition alive, specifically ape to human? Specific, how can there be no living species uh, transition, specifically apes to humans? I think if you get the book we, uh, called Bone, Bone of, Bones of Contention uh, by Marvin Lubinow, who spent 25 years studying all of the so-called cavemen, uh, you, would be you would find that every one that has been used as evidence has been disproven. You mentioned Australopithecus afarensis, better known as Lucy. Charles Oxnard studied Lucy, uh, did a computer multivariant analysis of all the bones, spent 16 years studying Lucy, and so he's, he's the most knowledgeable expert in the world, and he believes in evolution. But he said, folks, Lucy is just an unusual chimpanzee. It is not a missing link. So you need to study Oxnard's work on that before you tell your students we have evidence that Lucy is a missing link. Um, and we've got a whole series, uh, the book out there is the best one by Marvin Lubinow. Every one that's been used as evidence for humans, uh, for evolution of humans, has been disproven. There is no evidence that any animal has ever produced a different kind of animal. Uh, none at all. You can believe that if you want, but that's not science. That's the whole point of this discussion tonight. If one is willing to trust science to light this room when we go to the doctor, when we drive our cars and eat our food, why can't you trust the same science that tells us we evolve? If one can trust science to go to the doctor and drive our cars, why can't I trust the same science that tells us we evolved? I'd sure like to know what evolution, anything evolution has done for the advancement of science. All of the major branches of science were started by creationists. Uh, and the evolution theory has nothing to do with any of those things you mentioned. I mean, I, I understand electricity. I've built many buildings and wired, done a lot of My dad was an electrical engineer. Uh, I understand how it works. It has nothing to do with evolution. Neither does driving a car. I've done about everything you can do to a car. I've rebuilt everything, and evolution has nothing to do with that. I think science deals, the problem, the whole problem is, the question assumes that evolution should be part of science. That's where the problem comes in. That's my whole point. Evolution, at least above the variations within the kind, it doesn't happen. It doesn't belong in science class. It, it shouldn't be there. So evolution has nothing to do with science, and the poor students are being duped into all this, and everybody else is having to pay for it. The claim that evolution didn't ev do anything for uh, mankind is pretty interesting. Um, one of the reasons we have some cures that are fairly effective uh, against certain diseases, such as cancer and hopefully to some extent HIV, is because of our understanding of evolutionary processes. You know how uh, cures uh, uh, against uh, very little diseases like those work? They work by one of the most effective ways to do it is by bombarding the agent the virus or the, or the bacterium, um, with multiple antibiotics. You know why you bo bombard them with multiple antibiotics instead of only one? Because scientists understand evolution and they know that if you bombard something with one antibiotic, the thing that you're going to do is to select by nature of selection for a very resistant strain of that thing. And so, yes, you're going to solve the problem right now, but then it's going to bite you right back in the next few generations. On the other hand, they also know, because they understand evolution, that if you hit something with tri tri triple hits or quadruple hits, that thing cannot produce a single mutation that will cope with all of those four simul th th things simultaneously. That is why an understanding of evolution is not only crucial for an understanding of science in general, but it's actually helping people to try to figure out solutions to problems such as diseases like cancer and HIV. 
Why do Occam's statements substantiate a legitimate objection to the idea of intelligent design? Say that again? Who's? Occam's the theorem. Oh, Occam's. Why is that a legitimate objection to the idea of intelligent design? Uh, because intelligent design is um, one of those things that Occam will call uh, an unnecessary hypothesis. In other words, if you can explain something with natural, uh, natural means, natural laws, then you don't need an ex a, a supernatural intervention. Now, as I said before, I think, several times, the fact that you don't need a supernatural uh, intervention doesn't mean that there is no supernatural thing at all. That's outside of what we're talking about. Uh, it only means that it is an, extraordinary, an additional hypothesis that is, not, that is not needed in order to understand how things actually work. Um, science science as, a, as a process, not just biology, evolution biology, it works that way. Um, scientific, successful scientific theories over and over have been theories that have been uh, within the limits of Occam's razor, that is, that have made the fewer number of unnecessary hypotheses. This is, by the way, not to say people sometimes uh, mistake this for saying, well, then the simpler hypothesis uh, is the one that wins, and God did it is the simplest hypothesis you can come up with. That's not the way it works. Uh, the way it works is for unnecessary hypothesis. It doesn't need, have anything to do with simplicity or complexity. An hypothesis can be very complex if the thing that you have to explain is very complex. And evolution is a very complex hypothesis because it relies on a, on a variety of different, of different statements. A uh, good point. Natural, uh, Oscar's razor, uh, he says that you don't need the supernatural because it can be explained naturalistically. Evolution has never explained in detail how anything has evolved. They make up all these wild stories of how they think it might have happened. You need to read Michael Behe's book uh, called Darwin's Black Box if you want to see the real complexity of things. I understand how cars work. They're made from 100% natural products. There's nothing supernatural about a car. But obviously there was a designer. If I told you that a Corvette evolved from an explosion in a junkyard, you would think I was crazy. If I told you that lightning strikes and hurricane strikes, even Hoyle, who said, you know, a tornado going through a junkyard will not assemble a Boeing 747. Even though a Boeing 747 is made of all natural parts, it still has to have a designer. I was in Japan a couple of weeks ago, but I did not see the guy who designed the Casio databank watch. Whether I see the designer or not doesn't matter. This had a designer. And whether you believe in God or not doesn't matter. This universe was designed, and you will answer to him someday real soon. We have time for one more question here. Today we are listening to a debate on two theories of creation. Why is this discussion not occurring in the public school systems of America? I answer first on that one? Yes, you okay. do. Why is this discussion on creation evolution not occurring in public schools? Man, I wish it was. I speak in hundreds of public schools. Uh, and I think students ought to see both sides. And I'm thrilled that UT would invite, you know, this to happen here. They ought to also invite creation speakers to come speak in every, every evolutionary biology class. Give them some equal time. There's never been a law against teaching creation in the public schools. Any teacher tomorrow or whenever, Sunday, Monday, can teach creation if they want. Two states passed laws requiring teachers to teach creation, and those laws were struck down only because the states required that creation be taught. The court clearly said, you can teach creation if you want, but you cannot require the teachers to teach it. That's what the argument was about. Anybody can teach creation or the Bible in a public school, for that matter. There's no law against that. There never has been. I think evolutionists don't want creation brought in side by side because then their theory starts to look pretty silly next to the creation theory. I think that it's, it's a no competition type of thing. They don't want any competition for their theory. Actually, I happen to disagree with most of my colleagues. I think that uh, the creation should be the, uh, discussed in public school. Uh, it shouldn't be taught as an alternative scientific theory because it is not, but it should be discussed because so many people believe it, and there is a good reason for why people believe it. There is, there is a, an enormous social movement about it. Therefore, you need to take a, into account that, and it's a great exercise in critical thinking, incidentally. So I do think that uh, it, th these topics should be discussed in public school, and I teach... Um, I do, uh, I do practice what I preach because I'm teaching a course on the origin of species, incidentally, this, this semester at UT. And one of the things that my students will be doing is to have an online chat at the end of the semester with Michael Behe uh, to discuss creationism, intelligent design, and things of that sort. So I think it's a great exercise for their critical thinking. I quite frankly think that they're going to tear him to shreds, but uh, that's going to be his problem. He, he kindly agreed to do that, and we'll have some fun. Uh, the, the transcripts of that will be posted on my website, so if anybody's interested at the end of the semester, they can go and see what my students did uh, against Michael B, a sort of an indirect debate. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Dr. Hovind, Dr. Pagucci, thank you very much.
We hope you enjoyed this uh, video with our discussion uh, uh, with, uh, on creation evolution with Dr. Pagliucci. I certainly want to get him converted become, and help him become a Christian. If you're here watching this videotape and you're not a Christian, you can understand all the arguments for creation and evolution. It won't matter. The fact is, the Bible teaches if you don't have Christ, you're going to hell. If you're not sure you're saved, I'd encourage you to do several things. Number one, examine your heart. The Bible says everybody is a sinner. We have all sinned. We have disobeyed God's laws. Because of that, we deserve to go to hell. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ is the only way anybody can go to heaven. And if you would accept what Jesus did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago, your sins could be forgiven. 1969, February 9th, I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I am a sinner and I deserve to go to hell. But I would like you to forgive me. I'd like you to save me right now. And on that day, at that moment, the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross was put onto Kent Hovind's account and my sins were gone. And I'm going to heaven if I die today. It is not because I'm good, it's because I'm forgiven. You can have the same thing. We have an awful lot of materials on creation and evolution. We'd love to send you a free catalog. If you'd call us or write us, we'll be glad to get that off to you right away. You can get it on our website, drdino.com, D-R-D-I-N-O. Com, or you can call our office. If you're in the United States, you can call toll-free. That's 877-479-DINO. If you're outside the United States, you have to use the 850 prefix, but it's the same number, 850-479-3466. Thank you so much.